Are we good? We are live. <laughs> and we are live from the London Eye. I'm just going to start all that over again. And John's talking, but he's muted. No, I'm a teen Ivan up for his segment. Oh, okay. I <laughs> f***ed that up. <laughs> I know exactly what he's doing. <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> That's it. I don't have anything else to say. John f***ed me up. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Okay. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 58 of the Plastic Posse Podcast. As always, I'm joined by my lovely co-host, even though technically we're down one, but we've got a sub in off the bench. So going around the room, I've got with me Mr. John Benani, F. Ivan, Scott, Grant, myself, and the one and only Mr. Jim Bates. How's everybody doing? Good deal. Doing good. (laughs) Fantastic. I'm just excited to be playing Doug today. (laughs) (laughs) Your bargain basement, Doug. <laughs> bargain basement, Doug. Yeah. You're like great value, Doug. <laughs> well, this is a very Canadian thing. I'm no frills, Doug. Blue light but, special, Doug. But but he is sitting in the Jim Bates chair, so you know. Does make gotta, sense. I have a question for Jim. Is the mountain out tonight? Uh the mountain is not out because it's dark, but the mountain absolutely <laughs> was out today. It was another beautiful day in the Pacific Northwest. See, I'm a little confused right now, Jim, because in our videos, uh, well, in your videos, we can see you in a different room. So I'm kind of confused. You got a microwave behind you. All of our listeners can't see that. But yes, I am in the kitchen, which I keep my food, my microwave and all my models. Priorities. Can you (laughs) open up a cupboard and show us your stash? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I don't know if I uh, if I feel that close to you guys, but uh, unfortunately, (laughs) the cupboard behind me does not have models in it. Otherwise, I would. It could, it could be like when we had Brian Krieger on, he like microwaved a hot pocket in the middle of our interview. So <laughs> it's fitting because he keeps his finished stuff by the basil. <laughs> Absolutely, so those days are over. I think he's moved That's in true. to yep. his new um, his new uh, studio, mm-hmm. his uh, kids' room. Well, since I got everyone here, what's everybody working on? I will start with myself because. I can do that because I'm the one speaking. Right now, I am actually just started working on a 110 scale bus that our friend Jackson brought back from me, brought back to me from Telford last week. I went and picked it up today. I put it together this afternoon when I got home. I've already got it primed. It's pretty cool. It's a post apocalyptic girl. She's got a gas mask and just holding a doll and she's got a shotgun. It was pretty neat. Since the last time we recorded, I finished two things. They're both busts. One of them is called Offline by Pedro Fernandez Works. It's um, like a cyberpunk girl. It's not from anything. I keep getting asked that. It, I painted her hair to look like Rogue from the X-Men, but she is not Rogue from the X-Men. I just thought that looked cool. And then I worked on my first uh, Civil War piece because apparently I am an old man now and I'm painting Civil War <laughs> figures. Um, I have two uh, little mini busts uh, that Grant gave me. Uh, when we were in Omaha. So I started with the Confederate one first, and um, I'm going to do the Union one after I do this one because I did not have the right color for the blue uniform. So that's all in order. So yeah, that's what I got going on. Uh, what about you, Scott? So I've been uh, continuing to kind of peck away at this little Suyata T90A that Grant gave me. It's a really nice kit. You know, it's uh, quite a bit more detailed than like your average Tamiya 148 scale uh, model. Engineering's pretty good. It's not quite Tamiya, but good plastic and good fit so far. Um, So just been doing that. I took it over to, uh, we have a new Amps chapter in Salt Lake City. Took it over there and worked on that last night with a bunch of great guys over there. So shout out to them. But yeah, that's pretty much what I've been working on. 
What about you, Grant? Well, it sounds besides giving away all my models to you guys, evidently. Uh, <laughs> I actually been working on a uh, not very much, but I did. I did get the new Tamiya Comet in the mail couple days ago, which was, I got two of them, Hobby Link Japan people, Hobby Link Japan. I opened it. I started playing with it and working a little bit of it last night, but I will work on it this weekend. It is a phenomenal kit. Let me just say that right now, people. It is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Sorry. It is very nice. And I'm looking forward to working on that, but that's about it. Working a lot. Jim, what about you? I am going to follow on with Grant. I did a little traveling last weekend and I have been working a lot. I have not touched the model bench in two weeks, which is really depressing. They'll have a great story. I was supposed to be doing a uh, Harvard T6 for you Americans for the Museum of Flight case. It didn't get finished because I lost the landing gear, which of course I found today. So I'm going to knock that out. Really what I'm spending my time doing is trying to decide what's the appropriate 72 and 72 projects. I'm just pulling models out of the closet and looking at stuff, not doing anything. I'm more of a more of a pretender than a modeler the last few weeks. Just browsing. Yeah, there you go. Ivan, what about you? Actually, I already know the answer to this, but our listeners do not. Um, so since the last episode, I've been working on nothing because we had Telford and Bovington and London. So no bench for me, but today I started I started three models and each one has gone back in the box straight away. I, it's like I've forgotten how to function or build models properly because the two kits I started, the Copper State models, Lanchester and the Tycon Mark IV, I just I just couldn't I couldn't vibe with them. So they've gone back in the box. But I've brought back out of the box the Tamiya Jagdpanzer IV, the L70. That's now back out of the box, and I really want to try and get it finished this week so I can finally get another finished model completed because the last thing I finished was the Mac and that feels like it was forever ago. And uh, I've got F-14s on the build as well, but they're a very long-term project. I would be the award-winning Machine and Krieger, correct? <laughs> it certainly would. <laughs> as you reminded me before, I'm now a national and international <laughs> award-winning modeler, <laughs> which feels really weird that um, I won internationally before nationally but yeah that's uh it's fine because jackson's getting that build i'm giving it to him in texas that's his treat and john what about you uh i haven't been working on anything as i haven't uh, mentioned we were at scale model world telford this whole past week with london and bovington so it has been an absolute adventure you know i have a few projects on the bench still I have one for Jim's show. We're going to finish the Sherman for the Black Panthers. Um, so that's that's going to come up in the queue. And then I have a special project for a publisher. I need to get that done. And then really I'm at a conundrum. And I think Ivan potentially experienced this as well. And maybe we'll talk, we'll certainly talk about it more on our tele for special segment. But having gone to one of the best model shows I've ever been to, um, certainly the largest in the world, just an absolutely fantastic time. I had the opportunity to see a lot of work that I've seen before in print and seen, uh, seen in that, you know, medium is one thing, but seeing in person and then meeting the modelers certainly different. The table that stands out is the four points, uh, four corners, uh, scale modelers group there out of the UK. It's, uh, John Murphy, Pete Usher, Dan Sankey, Kev Smith, Andy Evans, and then also Ian McGonigal. It's one of those moments where you see things in real life and you have to like question everything. And that really did happen to me at their table. I thought I was a pretty decent modeler. And then I looked at their work and I was like, holy shit. pardon my French listeners, but that's the kind of moment you have when you see work like that. And it really puts things into perspective. And honestly, I'm at a standstill right now on what project I want to do next, because I want to do something to the caliber that was on that table. I have to think of the right subject to do it in. It's a, really a departure from my normal approach of slamming it, but really trying to execute on something uh, to that caliber. So we'll talk a lot more about it. Long story short, let's say I'm on the market in that regard for the next topic. Certainly lots of inspiration out there. I just got to go down to the stash and grab one. As you guys uh, have heard from John, we're going to be doing a special episode. John and Ivan are going to be doing a detailed uh, wrap up with lots of special guests that will be coming soon. So keep an eye on the Posse's Facebook page. You know, we could probably spend this entire episode talking about it. You know, Ivan, when he came into the room to record, I'm pretty sure he didn't. His 
his feet didn't even touch the ground. That'll be a lot of fun to listen to. And then of course, all of you that have been following the Facebook page, seeing all the lives, you could you could see all the fun that these guys had. It just seemed like it was just tremendous. But one thing I want to talk about before we move on, Ivan and John, you know, going to Nats, you know, we have, I don't know, what, 22, 2,400 attendees and you guys were in a model hall that over the weekend did 9,000 people. What was that like, Ivan? It's <laughs> it was fun because I took the guys in on Friday night when the setup was happening and only if my officials and setup people were allowed in. It was very busy then. Then I took them in Saturday morning when it was all to the traders and the club owners. It was busy. Then the membership were allowed in. It got even busier. And then it got to 10 o'clock. I said, right, now the public are allowed in who have bought tickets. And the guys were just like, no way can it get busier than this. It was ridiculous the amount of people who were in. Saturday, always busier than Sunday. That's always the case. But it was the buzz and the atmosphere. It was outstanding. I'm so glad the guys got to experience it because you can't describe it unless you experience it. Yeah, you know, one of the things I think that stuck out to me before the show even started, as I've mentioned, we had the opportunity to go in Friday night, the buzz even then, it seemed like it could be even considered a day at the IPMS Nationals for that matter, one of the slower days that is. But the thing that stuck out to me, you know, we stayed at the Premier Inn right up the road from uh, the, the show venue. And as we were leaving the venue, Ivan's like, well, the line will be out to here. And for our listeners, that line, when he said out to here, that's like a solid 300 yards from the front of the building. And sure enough, uh, we were very lucky to get media passes and get in a little bit early and have an opportunity to look around. So while we're walking in, we leave our hotel and you can see the line at the, at the, you know, at the end of the road where the, where the international center is. And I'm like, holy cow. And we, we walk up and it's, again, I'm talking hundreds of yards long to get in the building. And then once you get on the building, you go in on the right side of the building, the entrance to the venue is even on the left side. So you're talking another 300 yards. There must have been, I would say, over a thousand people in line. Uh, no doubt. It, it, yeah. It, and that's for the members. And what time did we, about 8.30 in the morning we walked up? Yeah, we walked in at 8, half 8, yeah. Yeah, and there was over a 1,000 people outside waiting. And what I think it's important to note is the they really had a well-oiled machine because as we were walking up, the venue organizers were walking down the line and handing IPMS members their wristbands. So when the doors opened, the queue could go right in. There was no queuing and checking things. It was, okay, the floodgates are open. We are running to Valhalla. And that's... That's, I mean, it was unbelievable. <laughs> and as Ivan mentioned, you know, the first hour is hot and heavy. You know, the traders, I think, go in at eight. The members go in at nine. And then the general public goes in. And just more and more people. You know, the atmosphere, the buzz, the camaraderie, it was electric. It was motivating and inspirational. Every aspect of the show, you know, COVID hurts a lot of things. Uh, they they took a step back from their, you know, penultimate year in 2019, 2021. It was good. This year. They stated quotes from 2019 was, I think, 10,000 guests. This year was 9,000, so nearly back in an exponential growth from 2021. And then despite having, uh, you know, limited international traders, the show was still an absolutely fantastic time. I mean, it was... It was really great. And and I think what we'll see, and Ivan, you could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but the international traders will come back. People will come back. The show is growing. The hobby is alive and well. It, it was really, really good. Not only the show, the SIGs, the camaraderie, but the contest itself, the, the work on the table was masterclass. Uh, there were some pieces that can serve as box art for figures. There were armor models that were some of the best I've ever seen. And the SIG tables even had better models than that in some cases. And we go back to the Four Corners folks. Um, you know, one of them, you know, they're all standouts, but, you know, Pete Usher's work, you know, Kev Smith, a, a gentleman that I've admired for a long time, and then Spud. And again, the names I'd, I'd love, you know, just push repeat on the segment I did on the intro, but every aspect of the so show was world class. And I would encourage every listener, if you have an opportunity in any way, shape, or form, go to Telford, go to Scale Model World. The folks there know how to put on a fantastic show. The only problem is I didn't go to it before and looking forward, this is a future John problem, <laughs> trying to go every year because it, it is that, it was that good. 
I don't know if there's anything else for Ivan to add, but we will certainly do a special yeah. segment on it. Yeah, we've the special segment's going to be a lengthy one. There's just yeah. too much to talk about, too many people to mention. Yes. It's, it was in every way a perfect type of model show. Yes. Yeah. And I will, I'll end with one thing and then it'll tee up the discussion that we'll have um, with, with everyone that we met and traveled with is, and, and it was from Jackson. So he said that celebra- <laughs> celebration, he said that Telford was a celebration of the hobby. And I think it's the, the best comment phrase uh, statement that can be associated with that show. It's not a contest. It's not a convention. It's not an event. It is truly a celebration every aspect of it through and through and the traders, the SIGs, the competition, they all built for that, um, you know, for that. And it's something that it, that's very hard to find. Uh, and we'll certainly talk more about it in an upcoming segment. I'm still riding that high, man. I loved it. You, you've got me just excited. I can't wait to hear it. And uh, we want to thank uh, all the people that helped these guys. So, you know, John, Brian, the list goes on and on. But, you know, you guys had a lot of people that really uh, helped you guys get around and and just had an amazing time. Check out our Facebook page. You can see John and Ivan's live streams and photo albums and everything just look like an amazing time. And uh, that'll be coming soon. You had mentioned John Bryan. Can't thank him enough. Malcolm Childs. It was a brief time that we met and got to talk. Definitely next time we'll do it more. Uh, Models for Heroes was a really, really awesome table and was constantly buzzing with excitement. And then two people, Luke and Graham. We're talking salt of the earth individuals right there. Truly, truly good people. Great hosts. Took, you know, John Everett and I down to Bovington. Just really great conversations. So happy to get to know them too. And we hope to have them on not only on this special segment, but I'd love to see them, you know, act in the same capacity that Jim's going to be tonight is, you know, we, we love to share the, the pod with people that we, that we know and love. And we hope that those two will join us in the future because that can't thank them enough. Speaking of uh, people that we, that we love and share values with, the Plastic Posse podcast is sponsored by Tankcraft, makers of awesome quality cutting mats for your modeling bench. Tankcraft cutting mats are killer. They're made from heavy-duty material. They're self-healing. They come in two awesome sizes, and they all have World War II tank and aircraft blueprint-style drawings on them. You can choose between a Sherman, a Spitfire, a Mustang, King Tiger, many others. New designs are also coming soon, and I can say we've seen them, and they're going to be awesome. Check out all of the designs and also the entire range of Tankcraft's unique modeling tools over at tankcraft.com. That's T-A-N-K-R-A-F-T.com. And remember, Posse listeners can use the code POSSE15 to get 15% off your first order. Do you know where else you can find Tank Craft Matt Scott? Where's that? The Bovington Tank Museum gift shop. <laughs> nice. So for our UK nice. friends, if you can't order online, they have a full stock there. So definitely go check them out. Awesome. Well, Mr. Bates uh, joining us tonight, and let's talk a little bit about uh, this show will drop on a Wednesday and uh, in the Thanksgiving weekend, the Posse and a Scale Canadian TV are going to co-sponsor a 72 and 72 group build over the U.S. Thanksgiving weekend. Jim, tell us a little bit about how you came up with the idea and what we can look forward to. Well, I didn't uh, come up with the idea. I ripped off the idea. Earlier this year, we were all involved in a uh, 48 build for 48 hours for Models for Heroes. And I thought, you know, 48 isn't really enough hours to finish a model, but 72 might just work. So I thought it's been a while since we had an event. And um, really, there is no purpose to this other than to try to get another model in under the counter before the end of the year and to have fun. And uh, I also realized I just don't want to leave the house on Black Friday. So as long as I don't let all the uh, turkey put me to sleep, I'm hoping to get something done. Uh, I mentioned it to you, Scott, and you guys seem excited. So we're going to do some live streams. I don't know if they're going to be Zoom or uh, StreamYard or something like that. I did... Thankfully, uh, Bruce Worrell from Kingston commented about the fact that time zones exist in the world, and I hadn't thought about that. So my intent was to start at 12.01 Friday morning, your time, and be done by 11.59 Sunday, your time. So it's going to be rolling. Uh, We are probably only going to have live streams going on during the... 
kind of U.S. North America thing. Uh, I don't know if Bruce or the voice of Bob are going to be our East Coast uh, men. Uh, I'll certainly take the West Coast spots. Scott will be somewhere in between and uh, just hang out and build a model because we all don't get to do that as much as we want unless your name's TJ. And uh, the reason I picked 172 is, is I can come out of the closet. I'm a 172 guy. But the cool thing about 172 is you can do airplanes, you can do tanks, you can do Star Wars. There's lots of fun Bandai stuff. So just pick something. Bob, the voice of Bob, wanted to say if he could build 21144, I'll let him get away with that. But most of us, it's just build 72. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, and have fun. That's really what's what this is for, is let's just have some fun and hang out. And I always enjoy when we have live streams. So let's do it and let's build some models. Yeah, we'll have those live streams on the Plastic Posse group page, not our main page, but the group page. So keep an eye on there and uh, join us if you can. Just hopefully have some fun and uh, hang out with friends and build models. And quite honestly, even if you can't build along with us, pop in and say hi, because it's always fun to hang. And I do understand lots of people have family responsibilities during the holidays, but I'm going to call out Mojo Dave. Come on. I did a 70 second build and you're not participating. Uh, before we do uh, the our Mac group build update, uh, Stephen Reed reached out to us and uh, he had this little message for us. And he's saying or said that after four years of trying, they now have a, in his own words, fledgling model club in Southeast Georgia based in the Richmond Hill, Georgia area, which is just South of Savannah. It is Southeast Georgia IPMS. We have a group on Facebook. If you are in the area and you are interested in joining, you can reach out to Steven through Facebook or through the IPMS chapter contact page. We have that link. We'll add it to the show notes. So yeah, if you're in the area and you don't have a club because apparently there was not one before, there is now one. So yeah, reach out to Steven. He's a good guy and join up. Uh, moving on to the group build. The Triple P Mac group build is sponsored by our great partner, Bases by Bill. Bases by Bill specializes in display cases and bases for scale models built by modelers for modelers. Their premium quality display cases are available for any model or size, check out their website at basesbybill.com to see their custom display products for bus and figures. Their custom display bases from, from four to 30 inches provide the perfect foundation for scenery or vignettes. If you don't see what you need, just ask. Chances are they can make it for you. Use the code POSSE at checkout to apply a 15% listener discount to your order. Bases by Bill for all your model display needs. I also know, because I just looked, they now will do custom plinths for figures and busts um, that you can give the size, the height, and the width. So it's pretty cool. Now, as far as the group build goes, the big thing I want to mention is Craig Flynn's raccoon that he just posted, I think last night, maybe earlier today. It's really cool. He did a really good job. He did the, I guess, classic two-tone green camo. It's very similar to the one I did earlier this year because it's the box art. Um, I took mine a little bit different direction than his, used different markings, but it's the same general scheme. Uh, it turned out really good and he put it on a little like, desert base, got like little rocks and um, stuff behind it. He did a really good job. I, I really liked it. I think he pulled off the two-tone scheme better than I did. Mine was... <laughs> A little too uh, samey. His has enough contrast where you can actually tell it's two different color green, uh, which I appreciate. He's currently figure out, figuring out how he's going to get that model overseas. So if I'm not mistaken, I think, I think Craig is in Australia. Uh, we chat a lot on um, Instagram. I'm pretty sure he's in Australia. Did you guys see uh, Lynn Young posted a, I'm not sure if it's a nutcracker or nut rocker, but it had a really cool, like two tone, almost like a low vis uh, camouflage paint job on that. I thought that was really cool. I did. I did see that. It is very cool. It, it, the other thing we have to mention, of course, because Brian put it in the group is his worker suit that he has had for, I think since 2009, and he just finally finished it. It's essentially a stripped down AFS suit. It's really cool. It's it's just like it kind of reminds me of the power loader from Aliens, but of course it's it's much smaller because it's a it's a power armor suit. But big surprise, it's amazing because literally everything Brian does is amazing. And uh, yeah, I'm so happy that he posted it in the group. I know he'll probably bring it to Omaha, so I'm looking forward to seeing it in person because like John was kind of mentioning seeing Spud's work and, and Peter Usher's work. Brian is one of those people where his work looks good, looks awesome in photos. Then you see it in person and you're like, it's even better. <laughs> I didn't think it could be any better. That's that's Brian. So 
And the last thing you got to check out in the group page, it's been a few days since it was posted, but John posted what we talked about last time, his frog Mac conversion with the frog figure and the lily pad. And it's just that alone makes it worth being a member of that group. It's so good. It's so good. You got to check that out. Yeah, the <laughs> thing kills me. It's so funny. And of course, he, he had to come in with the K2SO little meme that he made for it that he was going to wait to show until it was finished, but JB said I had to. <laughs> for anyone that has, hasn't seen the great Star Wars movie Rogue One, the sassy droid is called K2, K2SO, and he does not like Jyn Erso, the main character of the movie. And towards the end of the movie, she's going off to do something, and he looks at her and goes, I'll be there for you, Jen. Cassian said I had to. <laughs> yeah just oh god it's so funny it makes me i'm looking at it now it just makes me laugh because it's just ridiculous the fact that's on a lily pad <laughs> is, the, is the funniest part <laughs> the lily pad is classic john you're you're a magician man good stuff maybe we'll have him talk a little bit about it during our telford segment even though it wasn't there but he was <laughs> <laughs> because he had to be <laughs> <laughs> yeah so in general lots of good work going on if you're interested join up even if you don't want to or you can't bring anything to the nats and you just want to follow along please do it's a cool group it's got a lot of good modelers in it and um yeah as a matter of fact i actually had a little bit of extra primer in my airbrush today after i was priming this bust and i went ahead and primed one of mine All right, it's time to send a shout out to the Posse Outriders, listeners who support the Posse by becoming Patreon contributors. If you would like to support the Triple P and become a Posse Outrider, go to our Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com Plastic Posse Podcast and set up a recurring donation there. If you end up at patreon.com, a scale Canadian TV, you know, you can send me money, but you won't get anything for it. Uh, the Patreon helps offset the cost of bringing the Triple P. There are three different tiers of support starting at just a buck a month. Now, see, that's what makes a good guest. You know, we have Jim come on with us. I mean, that's quality work, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, that is good stuff. All right. (laughs) Starting with our amazing deputy marshals. We want you to know we appreciate each and every one of you. So here we go. Rick Cooper, Ethan Nydenmill, Bruce the Model Newt, Steve Baker, Eric DeGleish, Joe Porche, Bryce Lacar, Graham Pearson, Patrick Brown, Steve Schaefer, Jay Kidd, Paul Burdett, Brandon Gentry, Robert Klein, Mark Ewing, Ted Kawahara, Josh Orr, John Bryan, Scale Model Hanger, Toad Man, Model Doc, Doug Reed, Greg James, Les Workala, B Colt 1911, John Everett, the one and only, Josh Buck, Black Rifle Model Works, Thomas Bannock, Mark Bradley, Zach Pease, Joel Munson, Eric Brubaker, Jeremy Moore, DB Scale Model Studio, Matt Johnston, Jared Cow, Jeremy Elliott, Mike Talley, Previous Seat, Mediocre Middle Age Modeler, Dan Nofel, and JC Osborne. Ivan, help a brother out. Next, we have our other excellent posse foreman Rick, Eric, Mike, Craig, Papa Steve, Ben, Alex, Logan, Red Beach One, MD Models, The Voice of Bob, JV, Victor, Pete, Toby, Matthew, Matters of Scale, Damien, Kieran, Cody, Libby, Papa, Mike, Charlie, Tim, Forest Girl 73, Nukeman Mike, Greg, Jack, AK Armor, Ash, Irish Pat, Paul, Eyebones Models, Mr. Grizz, Jackson, Chris, Lee, Jamie, Steve, and Jethro. And last, we have Posse Outriders, including Paul, Pete, Zach, and eight others. We will officially release our new Posse merch site on Black Friday. Yes, everybody line up the doors. Here we go. Stay tuned, and we look forward to that very soon. Thank you all. You help make the podcast and everything we do really worth it. Also, if you as listeners could do the Posse a favor, please consider posting a review of the Triple P on the podcast platform you use to listen to our podcast, or even on Facebook. Each five-star review will help other modelers find the Plastic Posse. It's now time for our absolutely fantastic interview with the wonderful Brian Kreiner. Please grab a beverage and enjoy.
Welcome in, everybody. I'm here with Grant and Doug, and today we are honored to be joined by Brian Kreiner. Brian, welcome to the Plastic Posse. Glad to be here, guys. Brian, for those of you that don't know, is a very accomplished modeler. He's probably most well-known for his aircraft and especially those unbelievable natural metal finishes. Brian makes stunning uh, models. You've seen him on the cover of magazines like uh, TMMI, like his MIG, for instance. He's also the author of an Osprey book uh, modeling the Mitsubishi A6M Zero. So um, just to get started, Brian, uh, how did how did you get started in the hobby? Um, that's a good question. My mom was an artist, and as a kid, she would entertain us by making stuff, various craft crafty type things. And uh, I wasn't really interested. My sister was more interested. And then she decided that um, she needed to pick my interest a little bit. So she went down and bought me one of those um, Aurora. Was it Aurora that did the uh, Frankenstein and the Wolfman? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and King Kong and Godzilla. So she bought me those, and I just wanted to put them together and play with them. <laughs> but she would paint them and and uh, detail them, and then I would play with them and, of course, break them. And then later on, we had a, a deal. All the cousins, we would all get a chance to spend a week with our grandparents during the summer. And during the week that I spent with my grandparents, my grandfather would take us down to Toys R Us, and uh, and he bought me my first model. He bought me a um. What was it? It was a, I think it was a 172nd scale monogram P51. And I was hooked after that. And then I, you know, I, I, I built and, you know, it was, it was brush painted. Mostly it was just to play with them and blow them up with firecrackers and things like that. And then, uh, I think after, it was after college, you know, I, I bought a couple of kits at the local hobby store and, and brush painted them and decaled them. And I thought they looked fantastic. And then I think I was, uh, I was thir- 29 or 30 years old, and I'm, I'm walking around the apartment complex. Or actually, I was in my garage in the apartment complex, and I had my models displayed on this shelf in my um, my garage. And this guy comes walking up, and he's smoking a cigarette, and he's like, uh, oh, you build airplane models. And I said, yeah, yeah. And he goes, hey, those are nice. And I'm thinking, yes, they are. And uh, he goes, <laughs> well, I build model airplanes. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I can give you some tips. I mean, mine were absolutely <laughs> horrible. <laughs> they were crooked, little decals, brush painted, just awful, but I thought they were the best. So he shows me his models and they're airbrushed, they're weathered, really beautifully done. And I I just my jaw dropped. And he goes, uh, and I just I stayed there for like two hours looking at his models. How do you how do you do this? So of course the next week I went out and not telling my wife, I went out and used the credit card and bought a compressor, an airbrush. Um, at that point in time, I think I had three models in my stash. Yeah, it's, you know, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I went down the rabbit hole seriously, very deep. And, um, yeah, I've been having fun ever since. That's a, that's an interesting story. I was going to ask you, uh, while I was doing my online stocking for some background on you. I uh, came across your picture, uh, uh for uh, football. And so my, oh. Kind of my question was going to be, how does a linebacker uh, get interested in scale modeling? Well, it's it's interesting that you asked that. When I was a kid, so in high school, I, I kind of veered towards armor. And I started building uh, all those monogram kits and, of course, looking at all those cool Shep Payne diorama inserts. And my dad, who was a college football coach, and he played college football for Oregon State. He played baseball for the Mets. You know, he was this big six foot, two inch, huge guy. And, and, uh, he kind of made fun of me, like, you know, big football player playing with toys and kind of shamed me a little bit. So when I went off to college, I thought, yeah, I'm not taking these with me. So I just left them and I left them at the, the local hobby store. They got displayed on this, on the shelf and it said 17 year old Brian Kreiner, you know, built these, these models. And I think it was about four years later, the hobby store said, listen, we're taking the shelf down. Do you want your models back? So on a spring break or something, I went and I got all those models and I, I stacked them in a paper grocery bag <laughs> and I put them in my closet because I thought, yeah, I'm never going to build models again. And I think that uh, it was, I don't know, it was a rainy day. My roommate and I were in the weekend, we were drinking beers and we're like, hey, don't we have a bag of M80s? <laughs> <laughs> we started blowing up all those armor kits. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's it. That's, I'm, you know, I'm never going to get into models again. So it was, uh, it was that sort of artistic side that I've grown up with. And I just love big, loud, 
vehicles, engines, planes, things like that. And uh, actually, you know, in L.A., we live pretty close to Chino Airport. So every so often you'd see a batch of planes flying over. And, and uh, I eventually became a member at Planes of Fame. What a what a great museum. And uh, from what I understand, the modeling community out there is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I, I actually went to a show. It was the Pasadena Modelers Club show, uh, George's show. I remember I, I had built a, a monogram typhoon. Pretty sure it was a monogram typhoon. And uh, again, I thought it was gorgeous. And I set it on the table. And then Gray Cooper comes in with his Corsair. <laughs> and I don't know if you know about that Corsair. Out of yeah. the box, wins him a trip to Japan for Tamiya Con. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And I, I, I remember I went over, I grabbed my typhoon, I picked it up, and I moved it on the table so it sat next to his because I wanted to see, you know, the comparison. Then I was ashamed at that point. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, all those guys out there, um, Greg Cooper, Danny Clover, Mike Laxton, Steve Monroe, all those guys, Stan Spooner, just really, really good guys, a nice community, and all willing to just share their their knowledge and, and wealth of information and experience. So I ran into a guy named Steve Kays at one of those shows, and Steve Kays, also a Tamiacon winner, he built a beautiful uh, British Corsair. He goes, uh, hey, he goes, that's a, that's a nice model. He goes, you know, we have a club. And it meets out at uh, the Plains of Fame Museum. Uh, are you interested in going? So I went out to that club and I was, uh, I was tutored in the ways of modeling. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. And it was nice too, because, uh, we had, we had the keys to the museum. So we, <laughs> we, at that time we would walk out and we'd go into the hangar. We wanted a reference on an Avenger or a Corsair or a Mustang. They're right there. Oh, you are kidding me. I, I want to ask you about, okay, when I was a kid growing up, there's a lot of great model shows, you know, a lot of great events around the world. But, you know, I was 100%. My dream was to go to Tamiya Con, to be able just to go, let alone to compete and everything. But, man, tell us a little bit about that because, you know, when it went away, I was crushed. You know, that was just an amazing contest. It's like no other contest that... um I've ever been to. So it's, it was a Tamiya headquarters in Elisa Viejo down in Orange County. A beautiful grounds in the back. They had a racetrack for the RC car modelers. Then eventually they built a little armor field for the 116th scale RC. So they'd have big battles back there. The local uh, Marine Corps station, I think it was uh, 29 Palms, they'd bring armor out. So there'd be an Abrams out. There were reenactors out there dressed as paratroopers. It was just fantastic. And the, the, the raffle was, was just sick. I mean, they're just giving out, epic, huh? you know, oh, man. They're giving out RC tanks, you know, it was, and Mr. Tamiya was there, you know, and he handed out, um, all the first place awards. And then, you know, what, what a prize, you know, you get a, you get a, a trip to Japan. So, um, you know, I, I, I was fortunate enough to, to, um, to have won, uh, on Tamiya Con. I think it was Tamiya Con 2006, their 11th show. Their last show, which everybody blamed me for that. Reiner, you ruined it for everybody. <laughs> but uh, what a great trip, though. They they uh, they take you over there. They have people making sure that you're, a co you know, well taken care of, well fed, comfortable. And uh, when you bring your models there, there's a little, um, it was like a little booth uh, at the very front of one of the uh, model display areas. And it said, Tamiya Con Champions, uh, uh, Tamiya Con America Champions. And it was, it was humbling. It really was. People would come up and they would bow and they would hand you a business card. And I didn't really understand that at first. I didn't read the memo that said that you're supposed to have business cards to hand out to people because that's, um, that's a gesture of, of goodwill. And so I'm taking all their cards and, and not giving them anything. <laughs> Case it said, I, I told you, you should have got cards. What an incredible honor and experience, man. You, you live the dream. Uh yeah. Now, what was that win? That was for your natural metal, uh, captured American zero, right? If I, if I remember right. Yep. That's correct. Yeah. And that was, uh, the second natural metal model I ever made. <laughs> wow. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I didn't want to do it, to be honest with you. Um, it was Stan Spooner that talked me into doing it. And he says, you need to do a natural metal zero and then you need to cut up the skin and carve it. Uh, I think it's Jarsilov Goller. I think he's a Czech guy or Polish guy that, that did that. He goes, yeah, you'll carve up that zero and it'll look great. And I'm going, right. I'm, I'm going to buy, I'm going to buy a zero and I'm going to cut it all up. And he goes, well, I'll, I'll call Fred Medell and, and we'll get, uh, we'll get seconds copies of the kit for you so that if you mess up one, you'll have a backup. And I'm like, mm, sounds like a lot of work, man. <laughs> 
you know, it was, it was a lot of trial and error. I had no idea what natural metal product to use. So I tried out SNJ, I tried out Alclad, uh, and I ended up settling on Model Master buffable metalizers, which was terrifying because those things are so fragile. Yeah, you look at those things and they come off on your hands. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. Well, now, now you owe Stan, right, at this point, because uh, you've won and you got to go go uh, over to Japan and get the red carpet treatment over there. Yeah, he reminds me about that from time to time. <laughs> Well, uh, obviously, the the work that you've been doing continues on. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, maybe about how it was uh, becoming friends with Marcus and, uh, you know, getting some of your work in uh, to me as uh, magazine. Yeah. You know, um, when I when I started uh, really becoming serious about the hobby um, in, I guess, in the early 90s, you know, there was a, I, I mean, I was a, a subscriber to Fine Scale Modeler and I think Scale Modeler. And, you know, that was the source. And then, uh, then I started noticing to me, well, actually, I think the first time I saw a TMMI magazine was a Tamiacon because they would give out free copies of them. And the, the first models I noticed were Angus Creighton's models and Marcus's models. I was just blown away by the, just the level of detail and, and just the beauty of the final product. Those guys became instant heroes. Never met him, never spoken to him. I think it was a couple of years later, Marcus actually came out for Tamiacon. And, you know, Stan was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go see if he needs any, you know, if he wants a tour around LA. And of course, you know, so Stan invited him over to the house. And then I think it took him down to um, Dana Point in Laguna Beach and showed him, you know, some of the bikini clad girls and stuff like that. And, and uh, so there was one day in the middle there, and this is where Marcus and I became acquainted. Stan was working and I said, well, I said, I'll, I'll take Marcus to Plains of Fame since I'm a member. And uh, so I took him over there and we walked around for the day and took him to a couple of model shops and we kind of became friends at that point and have stayed in contact ever since. We, we get on Skype every day and, uh, we, you know, solve the problems of the world. Nobody listens to us. <laughs> He's a, he's a great guy. Very, very busy guy though. Yeah, he is. He's a wonderful awesome. friend. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It does, it does. It's amazing that he puts out such a high quality magazine. And, and then also when you realize how many of the models in the magazine are his, where he finds the time to do it all. Yeah. And I think he, I think he, he'd like to be able to build more. I think he misses it because he's, he's quite busy with those two magazines. We were going to do a, we were going to do a, a, a paired build. We were going to do that Zoki Mura 129, but you know, I don't know, slacker. <laughs> because life, right? Life, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to kick it over to Grant. Oh, first of all, um, Pasadena model club guy myself. Really? Have we yes. I, I don't think so. I'm, I came in later after you. I did actually make the 2006. I, I, was in the military then and yeah. I was at Tamayacon and I saw your, your aircraft. It was beautiful, by the way. I did go to that. That was, I never competed in it or anything like that. I was a good friend, you know, George passed away a couple of years ago, yeah. but as a good friend of George's, you know, I, I live right. George. You know, oh. the last time I saw George was at the um, Las Vegas Nats. Oh yeah. He kept calling me Greg. <laughs> And I go, no, I'm not Greg Cooper. He goes, you guys look like brothers. And I said, you don't look like brothers. <laughs> he goes, well, you should be brothers. <laughs> yeah, that George was a hoot. Uh, he was he was such a good guy. You know, miss him a lot out here. I'm in the Glendale area myself, actually, past, okay. right in the Pasadena border. So I, I, I've i been to a lot of the places you've been. We've been to, I know, at Brookhurst and No Stan on and off for years. Uh, uh, Wexler and all those guys are from, oh, yeah. you know, oh, the Amps guys there from Brookhurst. I'm a big fan of, I'm a huge Huge supporter of the Burbank uh, House of Hobbies out here, so you know we definitely love your work. We we ra we raise your flag every time we hear your see your stuff out here, even though you do live in Colorado now. So we you know we, yeah. we understand. Do you know uh, do you know uh, do you know Mike Laxton and Danny Clover? Yep, I know, I know, yeah, I know. Mike, Steve Mike. Mon Steve Monroe is a really good friend of mine. Um, okay. So yeah, we're all you know. So I punch him in the shoulder next time you see. Him. I will. I'll tell him. Yeah. Definitely tell him hi. I didn't know you knew Steve, <laughs> so I will definitely give him a heads up that you said. Oh hello. yeah. You know, in the olden days when his kid and my kid were young, they so we'd be at the show and I'd bring my kid and they'd play. They'd go off and they'd play Pokemon <laughs> or something like that in the corner. That's great. Yeah. Matter of fact, me and Steve were just in Antelope Valley together. Uh, oh, show. yeah, up there, and he did. He 
did really well. You know, that's a great show. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's the first time they've had it in a couple of years, so it's because of COVID. But yeah, we we had a great time up there, and it was a fantastic little show this year. Sorry, I don't, don't mind to go down the old the old folks road and so like that talk about old friends. What subjects? appeal to you the most is it aircraft or, you, or is it just are you i've seen your stuff and for years and i've seen you all of all of your stuff you do a lot of different things but what's what, what appeals to you the most you know um initially it was it was all subjects it was you know planes uh, armor um cars all of it and then i kind of got focused in uh, in one direction on uh, 148 scale uh, military aircraft and i compiled a collection of that and and i had kind of this sort of weird mindset of I suppose we're all a little obsessive compulsive. And so I would get an idea. I'm going to build this aircraft and I would just stick with it and stay with it. I wish I still had that mindset uh, because now I'm kind of all over the place. Um, part of the reason I chose a 148 scale was because I, you know, 132nd scale just seemed too big. And at the, at the beginning, when I first started getting into modeling, the, to be honest, the 132nd scale kits weren't very good. Yeah. There weren't any Tamiya kits yet. I mean, it was mm-hmm. Airfix and, um, Ravel. And some of the old Hasekawa gets and, and it was a lot of work to fix them. Yeah. So that's why I got into the 148 scale, uh, zone. And then, uh, eventually I got into 132nd because my eyes were going bad. So <laughs> you can see it a little bit better. <laughs> the problem is, is that you get, you get into the bigger scale. Now you need to add more detail. So it's not right. really helping that, uh, it's a bigger model. It's actually worse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had a love of, uh, of aviation. My grandfather was a pilot. He wanted to be a pilot in World War II, but he's colorblind and mm-hmm. he's passed that down to several of his grandkids, including me. So I tried, um, <laughs> I tried out of college to get into the Navy. I thought they won't notice. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I remember taking the colorblind test and, and I had like 2015 vision at the time. So my eyes were good. I just couldn't see colors very well. So I took the colorblind test and he's showing me those cards and he stops and he goes, are, are you colorblind? And I went, no, 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 I don't think so. No. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so they gave me the test like two or three times. He goes, dude, you're colorblind. Man. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> so great grand I, i'm even more humbled now i mean i know it's Ian brian's work and he's color but it's like oh, yeah gosh. it's just i'm just gonna start knitting i swear yeah, to God. Seriously, seriously. <laughs> well, you know basket it's, it's weaving. funny because uh you know i i i, I get with greg cooper especially when mm-hmm. uh i was doing that zero book mm-hmm. because originally when the zero book came up you know a bunch of guys in the area were, were doing their books and it was Bob Oler that came up to me and he says, you know, you should, you should do a book. And I'm going, yeah, right. But I do a book on it. <laughs> and he goes, uh, how about the zero? And, uh, I go, that, well, that's a good idea. Then I heard somebody said, well, Greg Cooper is the one that's locked down the zero. He's going to do the zero. And I'm going, oh, I'm not going to compete with Greg. <laughs> When Greg was busy and uh, so I called him and he goes, yeah, you, you do the book. He goes, but you know, I'll give you some tips because you don't know how to paint. You know, you understand color. <laughs> so he gave me this long lecture on how to do the colors right. <laughs> he goes, you got it. And I'm no, it's sort of. <laughs> so Greg was a, a huge help um, on that, uh, on that book because uh, yeah, I, I don't really understand green at all. And uh, so I have to, to go on the, on the advice of others. And it's funny too, because there was another guy, you know, Ken Schwartz. Yeah. I know Ken yeah. Schwartz real well. Yeah. Ken, Ken's Lancaster. also colorblind. Yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we joked about that. <laughs> yeah. He's a fantastic modeler himself. You know, another, yeah. another fantastic modeler. Yeah. We were, we are in lambs together. So Los Angeles yeah. model. So I, I just find it amazing that someone says, Oh yeah, I'm colorblind and you, I see your work. And I'm just like, it floors me when that it's just, it's unbelievable. And then, Oh, you don't know how to paint and i'm like looking at your stuff right right now and i'm like oh yeah he has no idea how to paint <laughs> it's like, oh yeah just like so, so uh, someone, the, the, you know, someone we, says that to you <laughs> you know the one that the person that bugged me about that the most mm-hmm. was uh, mike laxton yeah and you know mike laxton yeah. and he's an unbelievable modeler he, oh yeah he he built um he's an airplane modeler mm-hmm. and he just decided one day i'm gonna build a car model yep and entered it into miyakon went to japan yeah i just i just hate the guy yeah. absolutely hate him. Yeah. But uh for for a while I was building Japanese aircraft and I was peeling them off with tape and stuff like that and he walks up to me one day and he's got a cigarette in his mouth and he falls out and he goes, "You need to learn how to paint so that your paint <laughs> sticks to your models." It just keeps falling off. <laughs> so that's been his joke. <laughs> You know, all this time. Yeah, he's just... <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. So we've talked about models a lot, but do you have any, like, other hobbies? Well, you know, um, I uh, I love mountain biking, as a matter oh. of fact. And um, 
I was going to go mountain biking today, but it's a little bit cold. So I'm 60 bleed. and I'm a sissy, so I'm yes. not going to go out. <laughs> I, I, notice, I notice you like to bleed a lot when you're mountain biking. <laughs> oh. There's a lot of battle wounds on your on your biking pages there. You know, it's, it's um, I, I don't know. It, my wife, she's she actually gets pissed at me. She goes, you have to stop crashing. You're not allowed to crash anymore. <laughs> you know, you're past your limits. You know? so, I mean, you know, I, I've, I've lived this life where, uh, and I've lived vicariously through, um, through my cousin, who is a Hollywood stunt coordinator. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, he's, you know, he just does a little bit of everything. And so I, I he was kind of like my big brother growing up. And so, <laughs> so I think, oh, I can do it. And uh, yeah, so way, way too many concussions. Can't feel part of my foot, you know. Yeah. I've got a janky shoulder, yeah. but uh, but I love it, yeah. And what I love about it is, you know, you can get to places mountain biking mm -hmm. in Utah, and uh, Utah is one of my favorite yeah. places to go. Moab, uh, Fruta, Colorado, uh, wow. Crested Butte, just gorgeous places. And, and you really can't get there any other way. So, and it's peaceful. I meditate and kind of solve the, the problems of the world as I ride. I never listen to music, and uh, I love it. So. Is that why you crash? Because you're meditating when you should be concentrating <laughs> on the <this. laughs> I never thought about that. Yeah. Why is you watch the road? <laughs> yeah. I uh I made a mistake one time. I was out riding. It was six o'clock at night and it, it was one of the local rides here in Colorado. And <laughs> as I'm driving around, I, I heard a rattlesnake in the bushes. So I thought, and, and my, my rule was always, you know, be, because this trail, there's hikers and there's families. And, and if I see a snake, I'm going to encourage it off the trail so that people doesn't surprise somebody. So I nudged him off the trail and got back on my bike and rode another loop. And then as I'm going past that same spot, I feel something like a branch hit my leg and uh, I go, wow, I, I don't remember any sticky branches being there. So I rode about another 20 yards and then I stopped and I looked and I had two teeth puncture marks on my leg and <laughs> a little you, bit of blood you... coming out. And I went, that son of a <laughs> bit me. <laughs> Well, you you pissed him off, man. Yeah. Took yeah. him out of his home. And uh, the weird thing was, is that just for those of you that have never been bitten by, by a rattlesnake, he uh, I was pedaling really fast when he he bit me, and I think what happened was his, his teeth hit, and then he he slid off. Mm. But he sprayed venom on the side of my leg, and so Ugh. it was this sort of cold, like spraying alcohol in your leg feeling. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I'm about five miles from my truck. So I'm either going to, I'm going to ride home or ride to my truck and I'll either be fine or I'll be dead by the time I get there. So, <laughs> so I got, I got to my truck and I was fine. And I thought, yeah, I don't think you got any venom in me, but I should stop by the clinic, you know, just to be sure. <laughs> it's prudent, right? Yeah. I, you know, so, so I stopped by the clinic and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm waiting in the, in the waiting room and like a dumbass, I take a picture of the bite and I said, ah, the snake got me. <laughs> And I hadn't called my wife yet. <laughs> and so suddenly, you know, and just my son is calling me, my brother's calling me, my cousins are calling me, my friends are giving me advice <laughs> and be careful and, and make sure that, you know, and, and I'm like, oh, shit, this is going to be bad. And then my wife just goes on with like question marks and exclamation marks. What the hell? <laughs> how do I find, how come I'm finding out this way? So, so every time I go biking, she says, "Don't get bit, don't crash, <laughs> don't don't play with rattles." <laughs> <Rattlesnakes. No. laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. So you're really known for your painting, your detail painting, fantastic work. Uh, Thank you. I just and I I really like your detail work. Your painting's beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I really, I, it's fantastic. Your your finishes, your Do three three five blew me away. Thank but you. what do you find more? I I like your detail work on the aircraft. Do you find that more fun? Do you find the painting more fun? Which, which you know, one I, I like? like all the processes. I mean, I mean, yeah. if the, if I have a favorite part of the process, it's it's painting mm -hmm. the aircraft. But I do like the detailing. Yeah, it's it's tedious for me sometimes. Um, but uh, you know, ultimately, it, it, it's required. I mean, you need to do, you need to pay attention to the details. And right. what I what I try to do is try to see it because you know when you look at a subject for so long, you you start mm -hmm. missing things. And uh, so I try to see it from the perspective of of somebody else. What if somebody else was looking at this? What they would what would they see? I mean, you know, going to all those shows in in L.A. You know, the L.A. circuit, yeah, Orange Con, Valley Con. Con. And then there Spurfest. was uh, Minicon, which was Minicon. the Chino show. Yep. And then there's Semiacon. You know, you done that circuit and you knew who you were competing against and, uh, you know, you know, their skills. And so, uh, that mindset of, I got to pay attention to the details yeah. if I'm going to be competitive. 
um, yeah. really helped out. So, but I, you know, that, that Dornier, I didn't want to build it. I, I, I became acquainted with this guy. So Stan Spooner sent me mm-hmm. uh, a copy of this book called Wingspan, Wingspan mm-hmm. One, which is all 30 second scale aircraft models. And it's by a guy named Tony Canfora in um, Sweden. Mm-hmm. And it was gorgeous. And uh, so one day I decided to to look him up on Facebook and I just sent him a message and I said, Hey, look, your book is fantastic. And if you ever need contributors, uh, I'd be willing to, if you, if you need somebody to contribute. And, um, he wrote me back right away and he goes, yes, I'd love you to contribute. And I, went, oh, wow. I was surprised. And, uh, so the, the first wingspan book, uh, that I've contributed to was wingspan three with a green cover. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, um, I, I gave him a choice of subjects and he goes, well, how about that F-80, the uh, the check model F-80, which was one of the subjects that had already started. And it's a, it's a horrible model. It's just, it's it's bad on so many levels. I, I was I was drinking beers with Paul Fisher one day uh, for Fisher Models. And he goes, <laughs> you know, I was involved in the, the, the beginning of that project and I backed out because <laughs> it's just it's a bad model, right? <laughs> it was in, it, you know, it, I, I could go into detail, but Tony's like, no, 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 that's the one I want. And I'm like, oh, okay, right. <laughs> Not really cho- my choice. And then, uh, so the, for the second book, Wingspan 4, we were talking and, and he goes, so I again, gave him some choices. I said, these are the subjects I have kind of started and I was kind of thinking of. And the last one was the DO-335. And he goes, he goes, yes, I want that one. And, and yeah. I said, well, there, there's this, you know, <laughs> I think I was just starting the P-40. And he goes, no, 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 I like, I like the DO-335. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I kind of accidentally got into that, but... um but yeah, it's, so, you know, every, uh, every model is kind of like a relationship, I, I suppose. You know, you learn the ins and outs of that particular model and the, and the details of that aircraft. And that's, that's what I love about it is you become mm-hmm. intimately acquainted with that particular subject. Even though I wasn't really interested in doing a DO-335, you know, at the end of it, I had 15 books on DO-335 <laughs> and, uh, and I loved it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I, we all agree. It's a congratulation to your best to show there and call and, and was it Utah or Colorado? Colorado. Sorry. Colorado. Colorado. Sorry. Yeah. That was, congratulations. I well, well, well deserved. I appreciate that. So we've talked about the people, you know, who do you admire? Who is your, your, you know, your, your chef pain or someone like that? Um, that's actually a really good question. I would uh, have to say that um, Marcus Nichols mm-hmm. and his builds yeah. were an inspiration. Chris Walkup and uh, Brett Green. I mean, I actually printed off from hyperscale. I printed off with the old dot matrix printer. It <laughs> 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 took like five days to print. You know, but, <laughs> but I would print off, you know, the, the articles so mm-hmm. that I could just refer to them. So those guys were a huge inspiration. And then locally, you know, in L.A., it was guys like Greg Cooper. I mean, I, I don't think Gray Cooper's ever made a bad model. I, I, w- I want to break his fingers. I tell you the truth. I, the guy yeah. is just, he's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And he's building bicycles now. I mean, yeah. He, <laughs> yeah. He, he takes old Schwinn bicycles and refurbishes them because yep. I can, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, Danny Clover is another one, an LA guy that is just, he's an amazing, he's, he's such an obsessive guy and, um, and he's such a great painter. So looking at his mm-hmm. stuff is always, Really enjoyable. Mike Laxton. I'm trying to think. Steve Santiago or St. Saint- James. Mm-hmm. He goes by Santiago now, doesn't he? Yeah, he goes by Santiago now. Is another great modeler. Uh, Cyrus uh, Tan. Cyrus the virus. He guy's a maniac. <laughs> um, I love that guy. He's so funny. <laughs> you know, if something comes up or he pops up or he posts something and I always go, dude. Like, dude. This <laughs> is a dude fast, right? Yeah. So, yeah, those guys. But, but Marcus's models, I mean, I, I look at his models and, and, you know, the guy's so, you know, so, so self deprecating and it's sincere. And mm-hmm. I look at his model, I'm just, I just want to go shut the hell up, man. Yeah. Your stuff is, is extraordinary. Like that yeah. P38 book that just came yeah. out, the painting. Mm-hmm. I just can't believe it. You know, yeah. I just want to just, I'm not worthy. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah. So, but you know, the nice thing is I get on Skype. I'm like, how do you do this? How do you do this? Mm-hmm. And he's like, Oh, well, you know, <laughs> makes it seem so simple. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing is, is that all those people you mentioned are, are, are fantastic. And, and, the, and I think the, one of the great things about all of them is they're approachable. They are very approachable. You know, they're busy like everybody yeah. else, but they're approachable. And you, like you said, you can, you could reach out to them on Facebook or wherever and say hi and they'll say hi back and you ask how you do it. And, and I've reached out to several of those people and say, how do you, cause I'm an airplane model beginner. 
I've been building models a long time and I never, I hate seam lines. Like the, you know, aircraft seam lines scare the heck out of me, but you know, I've reached out to them and they've said, Hey, yeah, just try this, this. And it, you know, it's just, it's beautiful. One thing that I want to talk about, Brian, is you've been really fortunate. I mean, to, to, to be able to collaborate with the level of modelers that you have first in California and now that community over in Colorado that you're a part of, you know, you got Brian Krieger, you've got John Bonanza. You've got John Everett. You've got BJ. I mean, you've got uh, Steve Baker. I mean, you've got an incredible uh, community over yeah. there as well. And man, it just seems uh, like you've really hit the jackpot a couple different times. Yeah, when I when I first moved to Colorado in 2004, I was really. I mean, I, you know, there was the there was the part about missing my friends and missing those shows. And so I talked to I talked to somebody out there that was a former Colorado person. They said, "You want to go to Coal Par Hobbies." So I looked up Coal Par Hobbies, and the very first day I show up there, um, I'm talking to uh, one of the guys at the shop, and I said, is there a model club around here? And they go, yeah, yeah, there's a model club. Yeah, yeah, there is. And I go, and you know, who who are, who are some people that are in the model club? He goes, well, have you heard of a guy named Derek Brown? And I'm going, oh, you mean the guy that's won best of show at Nats like three times? Yeah. And he goes, well, yeah, he's going to be here. And uh you know, and he'll be in a minute. I'm like, well, <laughs> my palms start to sweat. And uh, and Derek shows up. And I tell you, I've never met a nicer, more humble guy. And uh, so we start talking and he, and he goes, well, well, what are you building? And I said, well, it turns out that um, I'm actually doing a book on, on the zero. And he goes, I love the zero. We need to talk. And, it, and what I didn't realize was in Fort Collins, just north of us, mm-hmm. there there was a zero restoration that was going on. And it's out in mm-hmm. Oregon right now. And mm-hmm. Derek was the, one of the consultants for the zero. And he oh. goes, I can get you in to see a zero. So, you know, it, I, I, I feel blessed, you know, that I've been able to meet these people, become good friends with these people and just, you know, maybe scrape a little bit of, uh, you know, pull from their, their expertise a little bit. You know, Derek, he, uh, he, he did a 170 second scale zero and he actually punched out little pieces of metal to make the fins on the engine. He handmade the engine mm-hmm. and, and like, you're a freak, man. <laughs> you're, you're you're not human. And, you're and an alien. Seventy second scale. <laughs> Seventy second scale. Yes. Oh my god. Oh my is gosh. All little discs that have been punched. Uh, out. Yeah. Wow. It's extraordinary. And you know, and now he he's got a ton of. Well, I think he sold a lot of his models off, but now he just takes pictures of trains and he does unbelievable pictures of trains. But yeah. um, yeah, just just amazing. And so so yeah, so Steve Baker. And, uh, Brian Krieger, mm-hmm. you know, we're just kind of getting to know each other and we had a good time. We, at, after the show, we went for barbecue and, uh, we're joking and having a, just a, a blast. And, <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, I feel fortunate, you know, that I've yeah. been able to, you know, become friends with, uh, with these, these various characters. <laughs> that's some characters yeah I'll yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you have any current projects that you're working on that you'd like to share with us like to talk about no i don't have any current projects whatsoever <laughs> look at that wow oh, yeah look at that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love this thing i love i've built more thunderbolts than any other plane and i it's just a, a big you know pugnacious monster of a plane but uh, yeah, so I've been working on this one for a little while, and and was going to have it ready for the show. And you can see I'm I'm really really close. <laughs> <laughs> what kit is that? That is the um, uh, it's a trumpeter kit. Oh, yeah. is it? Yeah. Wow, that's a beautiful kit. Nice, nice, very nice build. Yeah, and it's it's uh it's a little odd. You know, you have to build the entire interior, the supercharger parts that go all the way back because the cockpit sits on uh, all that tubing. Yeah, so that's one. And then the other one, actually, I've been working on for about a year. Um, oh, this is big. Uh. It's this guy here. So, <laughs> you know, it's 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 funny, the avarice and, you know, <laughs> that, that goes along with modeling. You know, I, I, I it's it's really nice when people compliment you. And I su- suppose growing up in the mo- L.A. modeling com- uh, community, when people say really nice things about you, I just I go, yeah, that's nice. But that's because I I know the guys that actually are like that. Uh, another guy that I forgot to mention was John Quint. Did you, have you ever mm-hmm. met John Quint? Mm-hmm. Just the, the the quirkiest, strangest dude. But is you know he builds only one nineties, full quote for nineties, and uh, he is the most precision model making guy I've ever met. Have you ever been to his house? 
No, I've never been to. I, I've just met him at a show, but uh, you're, you're yeah. right. He's, his so his model line. room. This this is how. So my model room is an absolute mess. Right. I mean, it's it's just it is dog hair and <laughs> stuff everywhere. John builds in a room with white carpet, and wow. I'm like, why? <laughs> white carpet? Are you serious? You ever, no, never spilled. Because you know he's that kind of guy. He's just a mm. precision engineer. So, anyways, I'm, so I got off. <laughs> he's that. like a like a no. rocket scientist. Yeah. yeah, just just an amazing modeler. But um, yeah. yeah, so the uh, the the B seventeen project was. Um, I, I there's no way I would ever chosen to do a B seventeen. It's just too big, and no, I don't have any place to put it. And uh, so my friend across the street, his grandfather was a test pilot for McDonnell Douglas back in the forties and fifties. And flew the B-17 and had a bomber jacket that he gave to his grandson. And uh, so we were talking one day and, and uh, he goes, would you, would you ever consider building a, a B-17 for me? And I said, for you, Dave. Yes. Because, <laughs> you know, I love you. I mean, these guys are <laughs> good friends. We we went to Scotland with them for a week. And so I said, yeah, I'll build it for you. You buy the kit and you buy some of the details and, and I'll build it for you. And it was going to be strictly out of the box. Mm-hmm. So... My quick out of the box B-17 build, right? <laughs> so I'm talking with Tony Canfora one day and I said, yeah, look at this, man. I'm going to, I'm going to build a B-17 for my friend. Isn't that crazy? And he goes, dude, he goes, <laughs> <laughs> he goes I, I have a secret. And I, and I go, what? And he goes, look at this. And he showed me the cover of Wingspan Special One. Mm-hmm. The Jan Kopecky. F-16. Oh, yeah. And he goes, he goes, I'm doing a whole new bu- book series. Uh, wingspan special and i go that that's that's awesome but what's the surprise he goes you can be wingspan special too <laughs> and then that that evil little person in the back of my head goes whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so my you know my out of the box build is, is you know he's turning into this big project i i have enough photo etch to fill up an entire box for that b17 <laughs> it's shameful but i i do have the b17 going i mean i've got there's the there's the firewall in the front now is this an f model or a g model this is going to be a g and there's the the cockpit if mm. you can see it yeah oh, beautiful and yeah my, so, my grandfather flew g's over germany so yeah, yeah it's beautiful so yeah uh, have you read the book of masters of the air yet yeah 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 that's Just, a fantastic book it's a fantastic. It's grim. Oh yeah, yeah. It's grim. Yeah. It's it, yeah. yeah. But it's, um, it's, so yeah. So that's that's another project. And so because I'm a, a you know people ask me, well, you know, why do you use that model master metalizer paint? You know, tell us the secrets. And I, it's it's not that that there's any secret to it. It's because I'm just used to using it. And <laughs> I have a bunch of Alclad here, and it's actually great paint. But you know, you get used to doing things a certain way. Uh, what I've done is I've just I've begged, borrowed, and pleaded with people, and I've collected like I have fifty bottles of that paint. <laughs> so I have enough to do to do like uh, I don't know, maybe with the B seventeen and the P forty seven, maybe two more after that, and then <laughs> and then I'm gonna I'm gonna so have yeah, to be since, forced to learn something new. <laughs> <laughs> since you're in this tiny phase of one thirty second Second's scale scale. <laughs> thunderbolt and and uh, flying fortresses, right, right. So you can't. He's not gonna use up too much paint, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the project for me the project that i've wanted to do for years is an f86 f30 and so i've got that kinetic kit and i've got everything for it and uh, i have a spare kinetic kit for when i screw the first one up so i have extra pieces awesome well that was actually leads right into a question we were going to ask you which was do you have goals for modeling including kits you want to build and things you want to try out you know, I do. Um, and I'm, I'm constantly worried about getting stuck in a rut. I think that, uh, and I see modeling, I see it as an art. I know that there's a lot of people that would argue with it, with me that it's not an art. It, it is construction, but it's, it's making a vision come, come to life. And, and that's, that's what's always driven me. My family is an artistic family. I always start with a picture in my head. I always start with a, a vision of what I want to create, and not just the, the scheme, but, um, how it's going to look. And that, that drives me forward. Yeah. When that, I did that zero, that one thirty second scale zero for the book, I was terrified, but I did have an image of how it was going to look. And I, I kept that image in my head as I, I went along and I made lots of mistakes in the process. You know, you, you build, if you're going to build anything, it has to be something that, that um, appeals to you. And, and I know a few people, um, and this, I suppose this is with any 
hobby that's that's similar to this. People that build because they're interested in in the accolades or they're interested in the prize at the end. And for for me, I mean, those are nice, but it, for me, it's it's I want to create that image. I want to that image I've got in my head. I want to see it in in three dimensions. I want to be able to hold it in my hands. And so that's what it's been for the F eighty six for a long time. It's it's you know just something that I can see. And if it looks anything in real life, um, like what it looks like in my head, it's going to be a really cool, cool kit. That's the part I think that's, it's healing for me because when, when I come down to my shop, it, I mean, it's a complete, I mean, if I showed you the counter right here, it's, it's embarrassing. It's horrible because there's pieces everywhere. And I know sort of where everything is. My hands just kind of go there and I, I kind of go to a different place when I model. I mean, I'm able to focus on the task at hand, but it, it's, it's meditation for me, which is good because I'm a school teacher. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, hats off to you there. Thank Do you, you have any social media outlets? Any uh, Instagram, Facebook? Where can people find you? Uh, well, I just have a Facebook. I've never got onto Instagram. I figure I've got enough rabbit holes. I've I've plunged into Instagram as one. I just don't want to go there. Not that I never will. It's just uh, you know I don't need more distractions. But um, I do have a Facebook page where I sort of post stuff. Um, it's called Scale Restorations. I, I I made it because at some point in time, I want to sort of um, embellish it and develop it a little bit. But for the time being, it's basically just a place where I can post some photos of my kits and things like that. We asked this to everyone. What is your magnum opus build? What is the one, the the ultimate build for you? If the you were to do, build. had could do one thing, one thing only for the, the last build you would ever do, the biggest bestest thing you could ever think of what would what would it be well um i would say that f86 was my magnum opus um the one i've really wanted to do but the b17 is really kind of turning into the magnum opus and you know because it it, it was a it started out as a task and it's turned into this this is kind of fun you know having fun with it uh the problem is is that as my vision changes over the course of the of the project and i'm going back and having to redo things so my friend across the street who bought me the kit a year and a half ago is like dude how long is this going to take? Am I still going to be alive? And it's on? <laughs> I, no promises, man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I started out with, you know, just the one kit that he bought. And now I have three B-17 kits sitting on my floor <laughs> behind me here. And every time one of those shows up in the mail, my wife just rolls her eyes like, really? Can I, can I have some of the basements? <laughs> can, I, can I use some of it? Is that okay? <laughs> that's, I would say that's the, the magnum opus. It's, 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 and, and what I like about it is it's, it's stretching me. Uh, you know, I think that uh, it's easy to get stuck in a rut and just stick with things that you're good at and avoid projects that are scary and avoid techniques that are scary. So I'm trying to remember. You got to try something new. You got to, you got to push the boundaries a little bit. I even looked at at one point in time, and this is absolutely stupid in retrospect. I think about this and I'm thinking, you're an idiot for even considering it. But there was a French guy. I don't know the name of the modeler. I think he's French that was building a one 30 second scale Spitfire and he started using solder beads to represent raised rivets. And I thought, I can do that on the B 17. So what did I do? I ordered a whole <laughs> canister of solder beads and I started. Rolling them into the little hole. <laughs> and, and after an hour, I had about one square inch done. And I thought, no, no, I, I can't do this. I, I want to do it, but I, I can't because I'm not going to live to be 200 years old, which is how long it would take me to finish all those doggone beads. Uh, Doug, Doug asked you about the magnum opus and then, uh, you know, B-17, three more on the floor. You, you know, Brian's just going to model a significant portion of the 8th Air Force. You know, that's, you know. <laughs> let's do it with style and then, and then add each individual rivet. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a sickness. It is. Really it is. Oh, you are, yeah. you are. And I mean this with all the love in the world. You are a madman. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that a 20 kit is coming out yeah. and, uh, yeah. You know, I my all my private parts are tingling. You know, <laughs> <laughs> holy smokes, that that's just a cool plane, man. Yeah, I don't know. There'll probably be six of those sitting in here. <laughs> Any interest in like uh, science fiction or machine and Krieger? I mean, anything that's sort of outside of that aviation wheelhouse. You know, um, I I was looking at Brian's stuff the other day and and was just marveling at it, and I feel like such a um, a novice modeler when I'm standing next to him because he just, he, he, I mean, he's just free forming, you know, grabbing mm -hmm. different kits and putting things together, and and uh, so not at this point in time, but I'm gonna mine him for information about um, scratch building because I'm a terrible scratch builder, honestly, 
I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm at, at best an average builder. I mean, I like to paint and finish, but you know, I, I'm one of those people that, that, uh, sometimes I'll have to buy a second kit because I screw up the first one. So learning little tips and, and stuff like that from guys that do that machine and Krieger stuff that it, it's just all scratch built stuff. I think that's, yeah. that's cool. Well, and being close to literally one of the two or three best machine and Krieger modelers in the world doesn't hurt. I mean, Brian's amazing. <laughs> Doug's got to step away uh, for a personal commitment, but we'll keep rolling here. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brian. This has been great. Thank you. Man. Take care. Well, as we start to wrap up here, Brian, I, if it's okay with you, I'd just like to talk to you about some of your models. I mean, we I think we've talked a little bit about that natural metal zero, but we've heard about the apex of the build and, you know, sort of getting your arm twisted uh, to do it. But uh, what was it like when you, you know, did you approach the build any differently than, you know, say any of your other models? I mean, what was it yeah, like? Yeah, you know, it was, it was uh, you know, the, the whole, I mean, I, I the whole idea of taking scalpel and carving up a perfectly good model just seemed insane. And that was when, you know, Stan said, you have to do this. And, and Stan's one of those people that, you know, oh, oh, this would be awesome. No, no, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so he's, you know, he, he said you should, you should try it. So um, I'm a biology teacher and I found these little scalpel blades. I think it's oh, wow. a German company, Grieschaber, but uh, they, they don't go dull. And it has a nice little curved tip on it. I don't know if you can see that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Look, look at and, that. Uh, so, so I had a couple of them. Yeah. So it was basically just carving up those panel lines. And I remember doing it and going, this is, this is a, such a bad idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, going back over that and, and, uh, I mean, it, it, and really what it got me into doing it. So years before my dad had, had you know, he, he'd uh, felt bad about his, his attitude towards my model when I was younger. And so it was my birthday and he goes, he goes, I want to get you a gift. So we go to Home Depot and I'm like, what's the gift? And he, he gets me a Dremel tool. And uh, yeah. <laughs> how about that? Right. Yeah. He gets me a Dremel tool and I got a Dremel extension and uh, I, I hadn't used it. I didn't really understand the application. I mean, I supposed, you know, that there could be an application for modeling. And so as I'm working on this and uh, I'm trying to smooth that surface down, I, I pulled this guy out and started practicing on the wings and um, kind of found a, a technique for polishing that uh, that worked and so uh, that was when I sort of got into that that vein of things as a matter of fact every single model I build now I polish the shit out of it with uh, with these guys here oh, wow and I go through dozens of these things and <laughs> I think it was um, I think it was I think it was Stan that actually said you know you don't have to polish every single model you know you, you can you can just sand it lightly and I said no it has to be polished it has to be shiny <laughs> so that's become my my thing um, now making sure that they're perfectly perfectly shiny and and uh not a blemish on them before i put paint on i saw your your p40 the p40n i believe um yeah at, at comedy fest beautiful uh, i i want to talk about the mig 15 uh the mig 15 is is probably between the that and the the do 335 is my the mig 15 is my favorite it's that is a beautiful beautiful aircraft is that 132nd is that I, it's, I don't it's, it's the old to me a 148 scale 148 scale yeah. yeah so it's it's the finish and the detail and the weathering on that is just phenomenal was that the same way as your other aircraft is just just was there you know did you well that was the first time i'd i'd used alclad i wanted to what was it to, yeah and i so i wanted to, to practice with a different medium and it Alcad sprays a lot like testers metalizer. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't polish out obviously as nicely, but um, so yeah, that was a little bit of experimentation there. I, I tried to kill the kit um, the other day, <laughs> getting into John's car. <laughs> Oh man, that's God. Not good. Don't say, don't say that. <laughs> you know, Grant, that's the that Mig is the one on the cover yep. of uh, TMMI, and I'd yep. encourage you. You know, Brian and I were actually on the phone. We were talking about this, and um, it's a great article. Brian's a, a pretty good writer, and there's a yep. the the article's written for with a pretty good sense of humor. You know, it was yes, sort it of a the you know if the article is it's about you know sort of well, I'm just gonna do a quick little build here. <laughs> this seems like a pattern with. 
with Brian, <laughs> you know, and then, uh, but anyway, Grant, yeah, check that article out. You'll, Definitely. you'll really enjoy it. I was actually, uh, I've got a bunch of those electronically on my iPad and I was on a flight back to MMSI and I read that article. And so when Brian and I talked, I was telling him I got quite a bit of an enjoyment out of not just the pictures, but you know, the article itself. Yeah. yeah thanks. It, it, you know, it's, 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 it's fun writing the article and you know, it's, it's just, it's what we do is, it's funny. It's, it can be silly, especially when <laughs> the decisions that we make. And so <laughs> this is a perfectly good model. And I'm like, Oh, yes. What can I do to it? To make it harder for me. Yeah. I'm- I'm still, I, I, I apologize. I'm still laughing about that pissed off rattlesnake that was just yeah. going to have, was, after you moved it, it was, it was not going to let it, let it go. It was just waiting oh. there for you to come back. It was a little bad. <laughs> and that's saying something for, and oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, was it Forrest Gump says stupid is as stupid does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you had good intentions, and that's all that matters, <laughs> that's right? That's all that matters. Well, tell us about your P40 because we've seen, you know, we've seen that model in person. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, obviously, it's been uh, recognized for, you know, awards on several occasions. But tell us a little bit about the build and how you came up with the scheme. And well, I love the P40, and it was one of those, you know, those subjects, like the top five subjects that I really want to build. And I, you know, I have the P40E kit which is a great kit. And I picked up that Edward, the Edward Hasegawa combo kit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's got the photo etch in there. It's got resin wheels. I mean, it was, it had a little bit of everything. And I thought this is going to be the one I'm going to build. And uh, when I started it, you know, trying to pick a scheme, picking that scheme kind of pulls me through to the end. That's part of the visualiz- visualization process for me. And so I'm looking through various schemes. And I thought years ago about doing a, a natural metal P40 because you just don't see them. Yeah. yeah. They weren't that common. And it's I, I just thought that would look cool if I, if I did that. Yeah. So um, I was cruising through, I think it was um, the Hannett's site. And uh, I came across those decals and ordered them. It took like six months for them to get here. I, it wasn't that long, but it took a while. But uh, but yeah, so it was a, it's a great decal set. It's got like seven different schemes on it. And... Yeah. So I said about uh, just making it look like that. And, you know, again, trying out new things, trying to push myself. I tried a a new technique because trying to weather that natural metal surface, especially with the metalizer paints, they're so fragile. And even I coat them with a coat of future floor wax Mm -hmm. as a barrier. And, you know, the process can even eat through that from time to time. Um, So I was trying to figure out a a good way to, to create that sort of unique patina that you find on the sides of P40s. And so I was experimenting with a couple of things and, and I was running a little wash of burnt umber in there. And then I decided, well, I, I want to dry it fast. And, you know, it's so dry here in Colorado. So I, I, I have it had one of these with me. The canned air. Pressed yeah. air can. Yeah. Yep. So I, I ran the wash in there and I just ran this down the side and super oh, dried wow. it, quick dried it. And it, it left this really cool sort of oxidized look on the side. I went, Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> that's very yeah, cool. So I started. That's cool. Yeah. They're yeah. super expensive though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Canned, canned air is, uh, like gold for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, and the reason I was kind of asking you about, you know, maybe like a machine and Krieger build is I think machine and Krieger piece, you know, one of the walking, uh, devices or, you know, one of the little bit larger things in, in the natural metal finishes that you do with the different kinds of patina. I think that'd be pretty stunning. I'd really like to see your take on something like that. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be something I'd love to try. I would have to sit down with Brian and get a tutorial. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, um, that, yeah, that's, I mean, if you could do, you know, I'm, I'm, don't mind. I'm, I'm not telling you what to do or anything here. Uh, a folk, which is the air, the, the, uh, flyer, one of the flyers would be in that all that. And metal. What's, it, what's it called? Falk, F A L K E. It's the one, Brian, that has the the arms that reach out that are based on the P thirty eight booms. Mm-hmm. You oh, okay. can kind of see that familial uh, resemblance in the design. Right. Yeah, it's it's a flyer. I think you know, and I think you would do a fantastic job on that. I mean, just the the panel lines alone, it's it, yeah. it, it, it would be fantastic. I want to break the mold we're talking about here. Sorry about that. And and uh, talk about your your Black Widow, your rather than the natural metal models that you're so great. At this one, you actually painted the green finish. What can you tell us about your uh, Black Widow? Well, that that Black Widow uh, subject was another kit. That was another topic that, um, like the A twenty, that you know when that when that thirty second scale kit came out, I just about peed myself. It was I was so <laughs> excited. So immediately, I I talked to Marcus and I said, uh, "All right, do you have anybody that's building this?" 
<laughs> and he goes, no. And he goes, well, do you want to build it? And I said, I said, uh, y- yes. <laughs> And yes, and yes. But, you know, Marcus, um, you know, he, he's my brother and I love the guy, but he's not good at mailing stuff. And it's kind of expensive <laughs> to mail stuff from England. And he goes, oh, yeah, I'll get it out to you. And then, you know, and then it wasn't happening. So it just so happened that my brother and I were planning a trip to, to Scotland. We were going to be in Scotland. And I said, I'll do a layover for a day in in London. Can you give me the kit then? He goes, yeah, that's perfect. So he picks me up at Heathrow and, um, you know, we, we did a tour of London and, you know, Marcus, he's a funny guy, but he, and he's got this, this dry sense of humor and he's sneaky. He's a sneaky b- is what he is. <laughs> so we're going around. He goes, he goes, so he's taking me to Soho. He's taking me all these places. He keeps buying me beers and I go, no, no. And he goes, no, no, no. You got to try this beer. So by 11 o'clock that night, I was just sloshed, <laughs> tanked. <laughs> And we were at some pub in, in London. And I just remember I walking out of the pub with my beer. And I just sat down on the sidewalk. Like this. <laughs> just, just shattered, right? And I'm jet lagged and I'm hammered. And, of course, Marcus takes a picture of me. <laughs> So, oh, I, I think man. he was trying to get back at me. There was a there was a picture that uh, that was taken right after the 2006 Tamiyacon, and so it was um, Bob Oler, Stan, myself, Marcus, and and Nick um, from Canada. Nick, he's an armor guy. Anyway, so we were all there and we were hanging out, and and uh, <laughs> we were Marcus was setting up the camera to take pictures, and so it was on automate, and uh, so in one of the pictures, I I kind of turned around and pretend like I was <laughs> the side of his head a little bit. And uh, it was just one out of like 10 pictures. And I don't think anybody even noticed. And then uh, he, he calls me or he sends me a message when he gets back to England. He goes, you thought you were sneaking one in there, didn't you? <laughs> he goes, uh, it looks like you're trying to <laughs> my head. And I said, I don't know. It was bad decision on my part. And he goes, I'm putting that in the magazine. And I said, no, you're not. You're not going to put that in the magazine. And he goes, just watch. And he did. He put a full, <laughs> full color spread of, in the back of To Me a Model magazine <laughs> in the Just One More section. And I, I thought I was proud. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit embarrassed, right? Because a few people are seeing this and uh, I, nobody really mentioned it. And then I went to uh, the Nationals contest uh, in Anaheim and I saw Brett Green and, and Brett and I had met before and uh, I just walked, hey, Brett, how's it going? And he goes, he just starts laughing and he goes, I just can't get that image of you <laughs> Marcus's head. <laughs> and my, my mind. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> Oh, I've got to find that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 2006. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, try- I'm trying to imagine Brett <laughs> just doing that. <laughs> but oh but the, the great thing is, is that we're all we're all in the picture, and nobody knows it's going on except for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was my little secret, right? And then, uh, yeah. And then it got shared with the world. <laughs> Good old Marcus. <laughs> and so, you know, the thing I love about this hobby is is just, uh, you know, more than uh, the, the building. I mean, I love the building, but it's it's the people that you meet and, and the friends that you make. And my very best friends that, that, that I have are, are people from the hobby. And, you know, Stan Spooner, I mean, he helped me move to Colorado. Oh, wow. You know, that's a commitment. Yeah. <laughs> so, so well, yeah, just- so it's, 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 it's fantastic, you know, and, and, um, and, uh, so I feel like I've got these, these brothers that, and it's hard to explain that to people. You know, when yeah. you tell people I, I, I'm a modeler and they just look at you like, what? I tell my students that I'm a modeler and they're like, no, you're not. You don't model. <laughs> <laughs> And I go, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, being being a part of great communities like you are, you know, that really, really allows that stereotypical modeler relationship, you know, of the lonely guy in his basement to really take on another dimension, you know, which is one of the great things about the social media part of it is, you know, getting to getting to meet people that you really look up to and going to shows and people like, uh, you know, getting to meet you, you know, I've, I've seen your stuff on hyperscale and online yeah. for, for years and years and years and certainly knew your work and your reputation and then actually getting to meet you and see, see your stuff in person. It's just, it's really, for me, really changed the hobby into a much more social, you know, kind of thing than it used to be so yeah 
it's the best part of the hobby, I think. Yeah. I, I liked your comment too about working at your desk is meditative. And for me, it's the exact same way. And I'm sure for many of us out there, it is. It's, uh, you know, for me, it's, you know, it's my time away from everything. Mm -hmm. I turn my brain off except for what I'm focusing on. And I just get there when I can. And just like you said, just work on your stuff. And that's a great comment that I think that that's, that's a very good aspect of this hobby for us is that, that getting away from the daily grind of everything. Yeah. And so, you know, we all, we all have that. And, and, you know, it's great for you to bring that up too. And it's, you know, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I think I have, um, I would venture a guess that, that all of us, mm -hmm. we all have, you know, we're at work, we're doing our thing and, and, and we have in our mind a checklist of things that we need to get done on our next project. I need to do this, mm -hmm. I need yep. to paint this, I need to make this, I need to fix yeah. this, you know, yep. that's great. Yeah. I love that part of it. Yeah. Yep. Tell, uh, tell the listeners once more, um, your, your Facebook, uh, it's called scale restorations, scale restorations. Yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, and I, I promise to be doing something more interesting and innovative with it, but right now it's just a, <laughs> a place to put, <laughs> put stuff, but yeah, that's right. Well, I know you, you, uh, participate in our plastic posse group, which we really appreciate. It's always yeah, great you. to see your work. And, um, again, congratulations on the best of show for the Dornier. Very, very well deserved. Hoping we'll see see you at commies fest in march over yeah. in uh, the denver area definitely yeah yeah great and then you know guys thank you for what you do i mean i think this is fantastic this is a, a great way to bring people together from all around the world and i think it's i think it's glorious so keep up the good work well thank you we really appreciate it and it's a, it's an honor it's a you know an honor to get to to talk you know with you it's been great you know grant grant is a great friend of mine you know i consider you a good friend and it, you know it's all because of this uh yep like I said, this collaboration that we get to do. So I uh, look forward to seeing the uh, Thunderbolt at some point down the line and uh, um, <laughs> we'll somewhere sooner somewhere. rather than later. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere between one and four B seventeen. <laughs> <Yeah. some point. laughs> so, and by the way, listeners, that's one thirty second scale B seventeen. Yeah, I, I can show you the the big pile over there. Yeah, it's looking like a pyramid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Brian, thank you so much for taking the yeah. time to talk to us. Uh, Thanks for having been me. Talking, guys. I really been talking it. about this for a while, and yeah. it was a, it was a lot of fun. I'm going to yeah, be laughing was. about that snake for snake. a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it, it's funny because you didn't get hurt from it, so yeah. like we can laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, I, I didn't get hurt from the snake. My wife just about yeah. Took me out of <laughs> <laughs> different story yeah, yeah absolutely yep well well thanks brian and uh, we'll talk again soon definitely thank you so take much. care guys all right take care all right well that was a great interview with brian man that guy can sure tell a story I, as you as you heard, Grant and I were pretty much crying the last third of that of that interview. But you know, Brian's such an amazing aircraft modeler, and if you haven't seen one of his natural metal aircraft in person, hopefully you can get to his show soon and 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 see that he's just a tremendous modeler. And we want to thank Brian for coming on. That was a lot of fun. All right, TJ, let's uh, turn the time over to you for I think a discussion point, right? Yes. So I call it your personal skill gap. It's not like the, the, the best terminology for it, because if, you know, like in the business world, they talk about the skill gap, which I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not a businessman. It's the skill an employer needs versus the skills that their employees have. Right. And there's a gap. So the way, the way I'm using it is kind of like there's a skill or a skill level that you want to you want to be to, and then there's the skill level that you're at. And it's like closing that gap and then doubling back on that to get from, I believe anyways, to get from where you begin, where you know nothing to where most of us are now. Like if you're a fairly competent modeler, which I like to consider myself competent, I, I'm, I'm okay. I do a good job, but to get where I am, to get to where like Brian Krieger and spud and all those guys are that's a that's a wider margin to cover in my eyes than it is to get from knowing nothing to being competent it kind of goes back to what john was saying 
at the beginning of the episode. And all of this stems from a conversation we had after the last uh, episode we recorded that we did not record. Um, it was after we were done and we were we were talking about it because where it comes from or why I decided to want to talk about this. It It's really it's Scott's fault. Um, it's all on Scott. And <laughs> because I will post something in our little group chat and Scott, especially my figures and Scott's like, Oh my God, that's amazing. That's so good. Oh, you're, you're it's, it's so, it's so good. And my response is always, it's okay. For the longest time, Scott would not accept that as an answer. And I know Ivan does the same thing. And I will always say it's okay because as I've said before, like my background in modeling began in figure painting, like small scale war gaming type stuff. Those are figures. That's figure painting. And then I moved into plastic model, you know, tanks and one aircraft and science fiction and stuff like that. And then I've kind of gotten back more into now larger scale figure painting. So I'm very aware of what is out there, like in figure painting. I I follow all the, like not all of them, but I follow so many amazing figure painters, like on Instagram and on Facebook. And I see what's in like this show that happened last weekend, which I I guess that's the weekend, same weekend as Telfer. There's a show in uh, Monte San Savino, Italy. It's a figure show, probably one of the best. It's a small show, but probably one of the best attended talent wise in Europe. And the work that you see there is it's spellbinding. That That's the only way I can explain it. It's they are legit just works of art. The best in show was a custom sculpt Bane Bloodhoof from. World of Warcraft, if you've ever, anyone's ever played that game, he's the big Tauren guy with the big horns. He's blowing a horn. He's got all everything on there. It's, I don't know, 10, 8 inches tall. It's huge. And it is absolutely flawless. There is literally nothing wrong with it. I don't know how many hours. Eric Simmons is the guy that painted an American, no less. Probably 500 hours just painting. That doesn't even include the time. Another guy, a partner of his sculpted it, whose name I can't remember. And, I, and I'm sorry. They shared the best in show because he sculpted it. Eric painted it, which is the way a lot of these figure shows work. I know uh, like MMSI is like that, where two people will win the award because a lot of the winners are custom sculpts. They also deserve the credit because they're doing a crap ton of work, too. So that, that's kind of where all this comes from. Because I know what's out there and I know where my level is. Like, I know that that's a lot of ground to cover. And then trying to figure out how to cover that ground and improve is hard. And I don't have an answer for how to do it, but I just wanted to see how everyone else, do they see work the same way that I do? Because that's just kind of the way I see it. And if you do, do you have a plan on trying to close that gap? Because it's hard. To get to get to the the elite level in either scale modeling or figure painting, it's hard. It takes a lot of work, like a lot of work, hours and hours and hours of work. Like I know Spud on his M5 Stewart, which I've only seen in pictures, and the pictures are amazing. I know how long in general it took him to paint that, and it took a really long time. First of all, it's it's large and it's almost flawless just based on the pictures. And John and Ivan, you guys saw it in person. I'm sure you can confirm that it's amazing. I mean, I'll start with you. Do you understand what I'm saying? And do yeah. you agree? And what do you think? Yeah, it's it's one of. The, I know I know where I want to be. I want to be at the standard. Like, sorry to keep mentioning them. Four Corners Model Club. The standard that was on that table. I want to be that. They've won the highest medals at the the best shows. They've they, they've reached the peak. I know how to get there. It's my willingness to put the effort in to get to those stages. I know I'm I'm a lazy modeler. Um, I don't do enough of it when I should. I procrastinate a lot. And my techniques and applications tend to be quite slapdash. I'm not refined enough. I, sometimes I do have the patience. I just need to be motivated enough to use it. So I know exactly what I need to do, how to do it. And like I said, it's not an overnight thing. It's not a couple of weeks thing. It's years and in some cases, decades of doing it. Yeah, it's, it's. I know where I want to be. I know how to do it. It's just the doing it that I struggle with. I, I don't know if that's really a good enough answer, but I, I know what you mean. And no, I do I, agree with you. I, I think it's a good enough answer. See, I also think that acknowledging that is an important step in, in growing, right? Because a, a lot of people, and this is no, it, you know, I'm not going to take anything away from them. They, they don't acknowledge that either by choice or they just don't know. They don't know what's out there, right? We talk about the average modeler all the time. Well, the average modeler isn't Spud. The average modeler isn't Martin Kovac. The, the average modeler is not John Bonani. They just aren't. 
And a lot of my, and that's, that's awesome. Like that is totally cool. Like I totally 100%, I get that. And sometimes I'm jealous because these guys just maybe just don't know. They don't want to know. I'd, sometimes I'd rather not know because I'm like, oh man, this isn't really as good. <laughs> yeah. Or they don't care, which again, I also envy from time to time because I, I do care and I get hard on myself and I know I can do better because sidebar to this conversation anyone can do what 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 these guys do i i 100 believe that it, this isn't magic you, you know we're not wizards or you know there's no muggles in in scale modeling like anyone can do any of this it just takes time and it takes practice in the right kind of practice that's the important part if you build 800 spitfires that's fine cool if that's what you like do it you're not going to get better at doing everything else you're going to get really good at building spitfires but you're not going to get better at doing anything else just like learning how to play an instrument if you play one by metallica 900 times it's a great song it's an awesome song probably their best you'll get really good at playing that song but you're not going to be any better than that you have to push yourself to you have to play a hard learn how to play a harder song same thing with scale modeling learn how to model something more difficult do it, something that you have never done before or you're not comfortable doing do it anyways and then you just keep it if it doesn't work out you just do it again that's the great thing about scale models you just build another one or strip that one and redo it but, i mean most modelers have what you know we all have behind us a wall of them just pick one and build it yeah tj you know i'll pick up here and echo what ivan said but also you know touch on what you said you know you meant you mentioned building 800 spitfires and being really good at building spitfires i i can relate to that i tend to think my three-tone camouflages are decent but i've also painted literally a hundred of them oh they're decent i'm sorry <laughs> Martin Kovacs, like, oh yeah, John Bonatti's three tone camouflages. That's what I look at if I want, a, you know, for a reference. I'm a one trick. Yeah, yeah they're, pony. they're okay, John. Yeah, they're I'm fine. A, they're I'm serviceable. A one, I'm a one trick pony, though, because I've painted a lot of three tone. But when you look at, I struggle with green. And I've talked about it in a previous episode, probably about a year ago. You know, there are things that I struggle with. And you mentioned the gap, too. And it's echoing what Ivan said. And we still mention the the four corners folks because it's really because they exemplify that's the best there is. You know, Kev Smith, you know, we've mentioned Pete Usher's dioramas, you know, Spud's work in, in 16 scale and his 35th scale work. A person that was there that I have admired for extremely long time, his name's Kev Smith. He is Kev Smith Modeling. You've probably seen his work before, everyone. Master modeler in 35th scale, focuses usually on World War II subjects. But the way he uses earth tones and layers and then storytelling with a single vehicle, it's world class. It's something that I've always, you know, aspired to be and seeing it in person has really acknowledged. And I think that goes this. This is actually a really great topic because Ivan and I just experienced this like we can see our gaps clear as day. Like I have never once I swear this is true. I have never once been, I wouldn't say ashamed, but not excited to share my work with a modeler because I walked to that table and I was like, whoa. And I opened up my box. I swear to God, I looked out, I looked at my stuff, looked at their stuff. And I was like, "Mm, I'm just going to put these over here and we'll come back later. And when I went and talked to him, I actually only took over two pieces that I was, dare I say, proud to show. I brought over my Brumbar and my Samoa. And even those pieces, looking at what was on their table, there were clear gaps. I've I've really never felt that way before. I've never been exposed to something that, I guess, profound, you could say, in the hobby. And major kudos to them. They were super nice, and we talked it hours throughout the week. Um, they were very generous with their time, very generous with their techniques and approach. And, and I took a lot of notes mentally um, that I'm hopefully going to take to the bank. But I'll also note you and, T, you and Ivan said it, I think the right word and a word that I always like to think about, not only in modeling, but in life is discipline. I think discipline is a word that really describes anything. And I truly believe what you said, TJ, and you can literally achieve anything um, in scale modeling. And I think so in life too, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's going to suck. It's hard. Um, but the hobby is no different, I think, in some cases. And if you truly practice your craft, discipline, you know, it's no different than losing weight. You know, you have a plan, you go after it, lifting weights, building muscle mass, you know, the hobby. And if you want to, and like you said, there are many people out there that they want to build their model and they're good. Like they, and they're good at how it looks in any way, shape or form. And like you said, I admire that. I I love it. I love every bit about that piece of the hobby. But I can also understand the other perspective and the other spec end of the spectrum where it's like, you know, you have the casual model that does it 
and they love it. And that's great. And then you have the hyper detailed, hyper, you know, engrossed, involved modeler that builds things and finishes things that are truly works of art. You mentioned the piece of Italy. You look at some of the work at Telford, look at some of the work at the IPMS nationals, you know, that competition brings the best out. So, you know, bottom line, there is a skill gap. My skill gap, there is a laundry list. Um, but what I hope to do is maybe use this winter break to understand how do you close the gap? What are the things that you can ship away with? Um, and, you know, as I look across the room here, I look at, you know, Scott's a good example for his slave one. I think from, oh, it's not that good. I'm not going to take it. Yeah, it kicks ass. Um, so, like, but you look at his work prior to and then post and the practice at his craft around OPR work, the influence that had on his latest Y-Wing, those steps are really important, um, I think, uh, to see that, you know, discipline was involved with that. I look at some of Grant's pieces, you know, Grant, you, you don't give yourself enough credit, your mini scenes, I call them some of the best I've ever seen, you know, everything from the figure itself and the shading to the integration with the groundwork, like, those are inspiring. And you can see your level up throughout that process goes back to another topic. And then Jim, you know, for you, it's, it's, you know, completing work, making forward progress, getting the momentum to carry yourself into something else is, is really important too. And I've kind of strayed off topic here, but I've noticed it in everyone that's online right now, you know, TJ with your figures as well. Uh, and then Ivan, you're, you're, <laughs> You say that L70 isn't good, but I'm really glad you pulled it out of the box because I do think it's a great build. Um, I know I've kind of hijacked this segment, but I, I, I wanted to just share that I've noticed it in everybody on the screen and I'll, I'll turn it over. I've seen Jim go off mute. Maybe I'll kick it over to him to continue the conversation. Yeah, I I spent a lot of time in the weeds really struggling because I wanted to be Mike Gramps or I wanted to be one of these um, amazing airplane modelers. And I kind of finally realized there's a huge gap between where I am and where I want to be. But I also had this realization is I might never get there. So the way in my way I'm going to discuss it is, you know, I'm the three chord guy. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm social distortion or Tom Petty. I want to be Neil Purge Rush. I want to know all this stuff, but I'm never really going to get there. And I think what has helped me is to just give up the idea of I'm going to be the elite and just go not to throw in another business term, continuous improvement. So what I'm trying to do is every build gets a little bit better. Um, I am so ham handed at scribing. Everybody makes it look so easy. I can't do it if my life depended on it. You know, if they put a gun to my head and said, scribe this circle, I'm dead. Um, but I'm just trying to get better. And I've also accepted I'm an average modeler. I'm never going to be an elite modeler. I'm never going to be a Banani or a TJ or anything like that. But it's still fun. And if I'm getting a little bit better, and I've been doing this a long time, but I took, you know, I hate to say this, but I almost took 20 years off of just not finishing because my, I guess throwing in another subject, my my eyes were bigger than my stomach, kind of the way to put it, is I thought that I should be doing award-winning work, and I wasn't putting in the discipline or the time to do it. And I'm not sure I agree with TJ that everybody can get there. I agree that there is a lot of time, and putting in more time will get you closer. Um, that's another problem I have is, you know, I can't spend 24-7 building models. You know, I wish I was Martin and could do that. Maybe I don't. Actually, that's a really good question. Would I want to do it 24-7? Probably not. But I think you need to put in the time, put in the discipline. I don't have the discipline. I'm, you know, not, not to pat myself on the back at all, but I think the one thing that I've consistently been working on recently is finish. So I think my finishes are getting way better. They're still monochromatic and boring, but at least they are clean. They're not weathered like, like you magicians. But I'm still struggling like with freaking basics, like filling seams. I don't understand how I've been doing this, you know, not 50 years, but 46 years. And I'm still struggling filling things. I'm still struggling scribing. These are supposed to be basic things. And I totally agree with TJ that from the beginning to competent is a much uh, smaller gap than competent to exceptional. And I think the other problem I have is I am 
I've been thinking a lot about this over the last couple of weeks. I am probably a pretty literal thinker when it comes to modeling and I'm not an artist. And I think that also holds me back because I think I joke all the time. You guys bring up the color wheel and, and I'm like, is that on my tire? Like, what is that? And I struggle with some of the artistic view that some of you are doing just, just it's, it, it's an innate in what you do. And I wish I was that good. And I feel okay with the fact I'm average. Like I, I'm good. You know, I wish I was elite, but it's, it's, you know, the big thing about it is it would be nice to have better work. Nobody looks at my models except me and, and maybe cornbread, but I'm not sure he does. And more importantly, being elite is not going to make me rich or uh, make all the, uh, all the people be my friends. So I am just focusing on kind of my journey is improvement get better, have fun, and do not let it destroy my mojo or destroy my progress. And uh, John, I really appreciate you noticing, you know, my thing has been trying to finish and I still struggle with it every day. And it is simply because I want to be elite. I'm not. And I've had to teach myself of don't strive for that. Strive for finish, strive for acceptable. Don't strive for elite. Maybe someday I get there, but my theory is at 50, I got, you know, 20 more years before I probably can't do this anymore. I'm not here anymore. So I'm probably never getting there. And, you know, I'm OK with it. It's all right. It's all right. All right. All right. Well, I, I'll step in now. I, I, and I do agree with TJ and everybody else when you say that that leap from beginner to intermediate is not easy, but it's a lot simpler from intermediate to advanced. There's a lot, a lot of things that that get involved in that jump from intermediate to advanced. Now, I, I sat and listened to a podcast about two years ago, and I can't remember the names of the individuals. And they talked about the difference of painters from the United States and Europe. And they both had reasons why each one is better or what why Europeans are better or why the U.S. is better. And it came down to it, it actually came down to a few things. One is that in the United States, we work more. We are involved in work personally a lot more than we are with our art. And art is not taught in our schools as much as it is in Europe. Another thing was transportation. The In Europe, you have train systems and anybody who's been to Europe, you know, anywhere knows that you can get on a train in one part of the t and be in another city and within a few hours it, anywhere in Europe. And I'm sorry, and I don't mean to jump off a subject like that. For me personally, I see that upper scale. And as a figure, a small figure painter, 128 mostly or 28 millimeter myself, I, I look at like Golden Demon Games Workshop stuff. Um, and I look at that and I say, will I ever do that? Will I ever do the the, uh, the, the highlighting that they do? And I've kind of got to the point where I'm like, no, I won't. Because to me, I've kind of set my own goals and set, instead of those goals. I've, I don't want to do something that is... And, and I'm going to piss off some people here. And I'm sorry for the language. I, I, I don't like the cartoony look of that heavy metal kind of painting. And I like I like more some European painters because they paint real. Now, the show that TJ talked about, fantastic. If you have ever, if you if you don't, you've got to look at that stuff that's on that table. It's a small show, and like TJ said, but the work at that at that show is phenomenal. It is beyond phenomenal. Um, it makes Golden Demon look like a candy shop. It does, and I don't, you know, it's that's what it is. And those people there, they range from age seventy all the way down to their twenties, and it's the time they put into it. And the dedication that they put into it that makes them better. And I'm 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 a huge, huge believer in self-discipline makes you better. And it's probably the military coming out of me. But if I have to sit down every day for a half hour before I go to work or when I get home from work just to sit at a table and just paint faces for a few minutes, you know, I I'll do that. I've listened to people that are fantastic and unbelievable airbrush painters. And what they do is they'll go home low paint in an airbrush and make the smallest circles they can make with the paint on the thing. And that's what makes them better airbrush uh, painters. So do I have a plan to get there? I think I, I, I'd like to think that I do, but you know, will I get there? I don't know, but am I going to stop? No, you know, I'm going to push this whole time. I'm going to push myself 
and self -de self deprecate myself to make until I get to the point where I want to, and I'll probably never get there. And I, and it's just the way I am. And if I'm not, if that's not the person that you are, that's great. If you get to a point where you like what you do, more power to you. And I wish I could be there myself. But for me, it's totally different. I judge myself to what I want to be or what I where I see myself as I think I could get to. If that makes any sense. That's my opinion. Like I said, I don't know if I have a plan. I hope, I think I do. I would love to paint a lot more. And then going back to what uh, uh, J or, uh, Mr. Bates said, is that would I want to do this 24 seven? Is it a hobby when you're doing it 24 seven? I don't know. Is it a job? You know, so would you lose that fun building if you had to do this like Martin does? I don't know. For me, I, it's, that's a hard thing to say. That's what I think. Well, um, first of all, TJ, great topic. And, and as he mentioned, we started discussing this kind of at the end of our last recording. And I think, I think where it comes from is like he said, he would, he would post work and I would comment on it. And I think sometimes we would get frustrated because I would, you know, I would see a piece of work that I genuinely thought was really inspirational. We all see things differently. And, and, you know, I've said, thousands of times we're all our own worst critics. So I think that's a factor, but I think part of it is too, is that TJ has a lot more of a base of experience with what he's trying to do than maybe I do. You know, I've spent a lot more of my life looking at colonial vipers and X-wings and Sherman tanks, you know, and less looking at figures, but you know, the, comp I would make a compliment that was genuine and stuff. And then TJ would say, man, it's okay. And so I would, I would hear that and, you know, I'd be kind of, no, it's not okay. It's really, really good. But so having the discussion really helped me understand why he would get frustrated when I would give him a legitimate compliment. But now I kind of understand where he's coming from, you know, and, and part of that was him explaining that to me. And part of it was me going to the MMSI show because then I kind of am seeing a little bit, maybe more into the world that he's talking about. And I saw, saw the work that I think he, aspires to up close and in person and, and got to see it. And so that shifted, I guess, my paradigm a little bit. And I even understood what he was saying a, a little bit more. And so part of it, I think, is how we see things. You know, um, John mentioned he struggles with green and, you know, he had a he had a T-34 that was he was about ready to throw against the wall. And, you know, we talked about it and, and uh, you know, talked it out. And I think the thing that he was struggling with was, you know, for me, just kind of a little bit, I had a different perspective. And so we were able to kind of talk about that, but I don't know, like I said, I think some of it is the way we see it. And some of it is, is, you know, you know, what we, what we value, I guess what each of us value going to the skill gap thing, TJ, I think you're, I think you're right on for each of us. We have modelers that we look up to that includes you guys, you know, that includes guys in England who build Yog Panzer fours and they think they're awful and they want to hide them in a cupboard and you're just looking at it going, you know, that if I did that, that would be one of my three best builds I'd ever done. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all, we all see things that we want to do. And then like you guys have all alluded to, it's sort of how do each one of us, what do we want to invest to get, as TJ said, closer to, to, you know, narrow that gap and, and, uh, make ourselves better. And I think it's, I think it's good to consider it. You, you, um, you guys know, I'm not motivated by competition. Some of us are, some of us aren't, it's not good or bad, but I think we're all motivated in our own ways to do what we, what we consider to be improvement. And whether that's the way it looks in our case or just the personal satisfaction that we take from it, I think we, we all want to do that. And, uh, I think that's a, a great perspective. So to kind of ride on what you were saying, I remember maybe it was the first time we interviewed Mike Rinaldi. Might have been the second time. I, I can't remember. It's one of the times we were interviewing him. He said something that stuck with me uh, since then. And I honestly try to not try. I do. I live by it when it comes to my work. And Mike, one of the best modelers in the world, it, Mike Rinaldi is. He's amazing. I don't think there's any question about that. And he said, don't fall in love with your own work. And I took that to heart because I will admit that there were times before where like, man, this is really good. I'm, like, I'm really good. And then I meet someone like John. I'm like, hmm, okay, I'm actually not that good because <laughs> I've seen John's work. Don't roll your eyes at me. And when Mike said that, one of the best modelers and someone I looked up to who by all <laughs> accounts, 
could fall in love with his own work says to me dad yeah, don't fall on, don't fall in love with your own work's biggest mistake you can ever make okay and like i told you scott i appreciate every compliment anyone's ever given me from every always i am that's why i show you guys my work not for compliments because i want your honest opinion and you guys we i know we all have talked about this but you guys are the ones i that we all free flow of ideas between and we're all honest with each other and when you tell me that you like something i take it to heart and i deeply deeply appreciate it i may not agree with you but i <laughs> i appreciate it but uh yeah yeah i mean that, and that's a great point and i think the only thing i would say is just you know coming back to it uh, always I, th- I think we need to always remember sometimes we get sucked into a it's sort of the antithesis <laughs> of what you're saying don't fall in love with your own work well the other the other the other edge of the sword is don't get so wrapped up and see one little flaw and and be dismissive of you know your work on the other side try to strike that balance you know of it and stuff because i mean i'm guilty of it too we all do it we you know we do a piece we see something that we don't like and we sort of i mean i guess i shouldn't speak for you guys but uh, I just focus. I just focus in on that. That's all I see is that area where the paint needs to be fixed or whatever, and disregard the other ninety nine percent of the work. You could pick a model out of either any three of my display cases. And I'll tell you every single thing wrong with that model. Yeah. A- anyone. I don't care when I built it. I know exactly what's wrong with every single one. But I, I don't think- know if this uh, is something. Maybe this is a future discussion topic for you guys. But we're all very hypercritical of our work. Do you need to be hypercritical of your work in order? To to make improvement. Yes, 100%. I, I think you're right, but yeah. I think that's an interesting because, like, modelers who are good with their work, they're not looking saying, Oh, I want to get to the next step. And I wonder if, you know, we're all, you know, pretty hypercritical of our own work while lavishing praise on our friends. Is that what allows us to get? to the next level because we're looking at our stuff and we're saying it's just not good enough allows you to then push yourself? Well, I. Uh, so I would counter with, I, I I don't think we lavish each other with praise. I know every, I know John, I know Ivan, and I know Scott, and I'm sure Grant probably has too. You might not have, Jim, but feel free to. If I show you a picture and you see something that's not right, it tell me. I know they all have. I, I want to hear all of that. I talk with Barry Biediger a lot, just him and I, when I'm working on figures. Barry is a damn good figure modeler. I mean, I, I believe he I know he's a master at MFCA, which is like their, that's like getting the Chicago medal at MSI. He might have one of those too. I'm sure he probably does. Barry is amazing. I've seen his work in person. It's phenomenal. Yeah. yeah and yeah, he's, he's a damn good scale modeler too. Not only is he an amazing figure painter, his scale models are awesome. So yeah, and I, I bet he's super excited for bragging on him right now because he's because he's humble to a fault. He uh, is. Yeah. You, yeah, Scott, you think I'm you think yeah. I argue with you. He does. He, he argued with me to his face. Yeah. Well, I Ivan, I, I, I want you to kind of, you know, building on what Jim said, I really want your perspective on that, because, you know, we all have a common point of reference here on that Yogg Panzer four, where I think it was pretty unanimous, guys. Right. I mean, we all thought it was a pretty special piece but you made a comment to me that really resonated and you said this this model the finish on this model is giving me no joy and that Mm -hmm. sort of ended ended the discussion because i think for at least for me that was an interesting perspective but yeah i'd like you to kind of maybe talk about that yeah it's a weird one because what i don't like doing is if i've not everyone, but a lot of people are saying, I really like it, or it looks great or whatever. And I'm saying, no, it doesn't. I don't want that to make, I don't want it to sound like I think what you think looks good is bad, if that makes sense. I don't want it to come across that way. It's, for example, the Egg Panzer 4, I'm looking at it now and I'm thinking, why was I so bothered back then? Because I look at it now, it's like, that's that's actually all right. For some reason, it took months to get past whatever block I had. Yeah, it's a weird one because like I said, you you all said there's nothing wrong with it, just keep going. But there was something about it and I couldn't even identify what the issue was. I didn't know where the fault was, but there was something that wasn't fulfilling me to the point where I could progress or finish the model. It was just, there was a block and I couldn't pass it. And because most of you guys really liked it, 
it was it was hard. I couldn't ask you what the issue was because you guys didn't see one. So I, it, it was a really weird situation. It's yeah, <laughs> it's a weird one. What do you think, John? I mean, have you ever had one of those projects where you know technically maybe the model was okay, but you just weren't feeling any joy from it, and so you were hung on hung up on it for that reason? God, this is going to sound really childish, but I feel about that with every model now after what I saw at Telford. Yeah. I'm, I'm being dead serious, 100% serious. I look at my display case. I look at some things I've built. Some of them are close. Like the Yog Panther I did recently, I feel good about it. But there are many that I thought were, yeah, well, they were pretty good, but they... Uh, there's there's a gap there. And I mean, maybe that's why I also have like 20 shelf queens uh, as well, where, you know, it gets to a point you're like, I'm not feeling it. You just put it away and walk away. One of them's up on my shelf looking at me right now. It's, I feel like it's going on 17 years. I'll buy it. You know, I'll buy some cigarettes next year. <laughs> so, you know, no, I it's uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's it's a really interesting topic. Mm. It's a lot yeah, of thought. Yeah. There's another thing I sorry I no good please uh, please go ahead. no there's another thought there too that you bring up is like I wonder if I'm like you I've got a lot of shelf queens too and I wonder if I focused a little bit better on finishing even though I don't like where I'm at maybe that would make me a better painter in a way I don't know because I know people that build one kit at a time one kit at a time and they have no stash they have maybe the next build aircraft or whatever and i'm i'm talking about you ed um 100 they build one thing at a time and they're very 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 good models but you know and he forces his way through this little problem you know i wonder if that's something you know maybe that's a topic we can talk about in the future also is that you know if maybe not making a shelf queen and finishing up even though you're not happy with it is improving your style yeah john, john Bryan on that catalimi when we had him on the show he's never he he just doesn't not finish models when he starts one he doesn't start another one till it's done and he finishes every one he starts yeah it's amazing that would it's it is it's it's, it's that's discipline i mean that's a hundred percent discipline right there mm. but i mean uh, i think kind of going back to something that was said before like the the value of really good feedback from a group of people you admire is invaluable this year I, i've never it's going to sound really braggy I've never won trophies, uh, medals or anything. And this year alone from knowing you guys and the guys in the chat, I've won three. One at US, two in the US actually, sorry, and one at our nationals. And I could never have done that if it weren't for the feedback from from you guys. I mean, I'm not, I'm no JB, I'm no TJ, I'm no Jackson. I've only won three medals, but the, the value of that feedback and and the the community we have aids that improvement rather than me just trying to judge it for myself. There was there was a lot of stunning work on the table at the competition and in the SIGs. Yeah. I do have one question about Telford. The Sherman diorama with the nun on top has the, the nun and has the bicycle out front and she's standing on the on top of the Sherman pointing it out. Was that part of Four Corners or was it that? Was. Yes. It that was. was Peter Usher's divine intervention. That yes. is unbelievable in pictures. I don't, I can't imagine what it looks like in real life, but that is uh, the bike alone that the nun's bike with the back cover on the wheel. And it's got the, the, the cross and the, and the, oh, oh, no, no. I mean, it, tr- again, Grant, you've picked a good topic because that only further illustrates the skill gap in which I've come to <laughs> come very intimately familiar with uh, since leaving Telford and, you know, thinking about it on the long plane ride home, it's like, what is the next project to identify those gaps and hopefully bring closure to them? I mean, that that piece right there illustrates so many gaps. Groundwork, scratch build work on the building, sculpting, weathering, storytelling, literally every piece of it. And setting the mood too, I think, is another one. You know, it's it's making sure that and I and I really applaud Peter Usher. He builds um, his vehicles first. So there he had a Panther A, which when you meet him, Grant, uh, he'll just pick up his work and hand to you. Um, it's like, okay, oh, great, cool, man. I feel like I'm holding the Mona Lisa here. Um, <laughs> but it just kind of shows you how much he's willing to share and and help you close those gaps. And everybody mm-hmm. there is. But yeah, he, he's really interesting that he'll build, you know, the, the armor piece first with a figure and then integrate it to the in into the scene so it's like he's got that vision of what it's going to look like the the tone the feeling the the overall effect 
in his mind and he pieces it together. And I think I would stroke now I'm going to try it, but I think I would struggle with that because I'd almost be like, okay, someone just plopped this green tank into this, into this scene. And it doesn't like all blend well together. Um, you know, he's got a Churchill uh, AVRE that he's putting together that's finished and it is dropped it or just not sure what the final scene will be of it um but it certainly sets up really tees up for some nice diorama mm-hmm. but yeah ivan i don't know i don't know if you felt the same way at that uh, scene a piece like that for for instance. yeah one thing again four corners we're going to mention them a lot because they're just outstanding another thing me and jackson were talking about was dan sankey not only yeah. are his models and his dioramas exquisite but the amount of effort and detail he goes through into actually the base that the yeah. model is on the ambulance, ambulance. Uh, it's, it's a highly polished beautiful piece of wood it's a really nice plinth there's there's a story on it it's that's really nice but then also hit the mark 5 he did where the entire base surrounding mm-hmm. is like the mark 5 armor it's got the bolts on it it's got the rust streak the chipped paint we were saying we kind of use the the crutch of a black box or black base to put a scene on i get why because then it draws all the attention to the scene itself but the amount of effort dan puts into the base itself it's like just as much effort into the actual composition of the the scene and it makes it really stand and that's why you got gold because the effort and care that went into it that was one of those situations where it's like right i know what i need to do to get to that level you've got to give everything the same amount of current attention. You kind of think, right, scene's done. I'll just slap some black black paint on the side of this foam. It's like, no, you, you've got to give everything the same amount of the current attention, love and respect. Yeah, and that's. I think that's the big thing. And, and with, with TJ subject is that when you go from that intermediate, you have to take the whole environment of that model or what you're placing on that model on into that next growth step is that you can't just put the model down and say, okay, here we go. Well, the next growth step is a base. And then you, you start doing groundwork and then you start doing scratch building and you start doing vegetation. And that's where, you know, that's where the steps increase and where you get better as a modeler, in my opinion, because, you know, I see, I see those, those dioramas, some of the dioramas there, the bomber, the gentleman you met with the way the splash coming up behind the, uh, the, the bomber itself, that was fantastic. First of all, that was it was it was dynamic. It was telling a story. It was it grabbed a person as soon as they looked at it. So that's how you move up. You do stuff like that and tell a story in a diorama. Like everybody says, and every book says that you can buy or everything you can read is when you look at when you're looking at a diorama or a vignette, tell a story. Don't have two guys standing there and then something behind it. What's the story behind it? You know, give us something. Shep Payne wrote about it back in the 70s, you know, and I'm sure people were writing about it before. You know, give us something. And those models do. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize what Ivan said about bases and, and you, Grant, too. You know, another person that's that has exemplified it, Piero Lovland does a lot of, you know, dynamic dioramas. It integrates scenes into his base. He did one where it was a whippet I think the guy was crawling out of it or, or it was some of his bases, they, they have laser etching on the wood. So he'll burn, you know, he'll get it professionally burned in, you know, a scene from world war one from no man's land, or he did one where it was the, is the Halberstadt that was crashed at sea and the pilots reaching out to his, to his friend yeah. around the base. He's got the lozenge uh, pattern from the wing. He's got a compass on it. You know, his 101 Dalmatian, 101st Dalmatian base, you know, has a has a really nice art frame around it, like simple things like that. It's as I like to go back to one of my favorite movies, John Hammond from Jurassic Park, spared no expense. You know, you look at that in every aspect of the model. And he, I would even say, Grant, some of, you know, your work, too, where you're putting the little things on the base, the footings on the base, you know having the high polished wood, a a classy laser etched plate. You know, I look at Scott's Y-Wing with the, you know, trench, uh, you know, plates framed nicely in a black. And then it has the multiple plates that tell, you know, the story and talk about the piece. Like those things, you know, I know the original topic was about skill gaps. And maybe I think what we've talked about a lot is not only what we like and what we see, but also the things that we aspire to achieve. It's been really, it's been a really valuable conversation. I think around that is, I'm. We've certainly talked a lot about 
different topics. And it's, it's all the things that I look around my completion cabinet and I don't have that part of a lot of my displays and something that I will strive to improve on. You know, that's one of the things about Jim show, the uh, model mania show that when we went to last year and that we're going to go to again, it's a different kind of show where we got to see table by table, what TJ's talking about, you know, where people are narrowing that gap, you can see it in real time. You know, Joshua, Josh Scott, our buddy, Cobra Ply, you know, we got to see some of the pieces that he started with and then what his latest pieces were. And you could see the growth and the progression and you could see that gap getting smaller. And then another person that um, we've been able to see in real time because he's amazing and his output is crazy is our friend Martin Drayton, um, MD Models. Just since we met him at, at Nationals, you know, each diorama that he produces, it's like you can see this big step that he's taking. You know, and you can see that probably before too long, he's going to be up with up with the big boys. You just see those steps of progression. And I think that really illustrates TJ's point. I agree with you, John. It's a a great discussion, TJ. You know, one more person I'll hit on. uh, We haven't talked about, but he's a great diorama builder and he is in every aspect of the build and finish and the presentation is Bill Huffman. Um, I mean, his work is honestly like professional furniture. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Holy cow. And, and, you know, you talk about someone that brings it, you know, hundred percent, that's, that's an example where if you go to the show that Jim's putting on in February in Seattle, you will see Bill's work. You will be flabbergasted by his work. Fine furniture quality. He's not afraid to work in the vertical. I mean, just yeah. incre- incredible. Yeah, this will have happened by the time this show goes on, but we're having our mini show tomorrow, Saturday, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the lines of people around his work because it is, it's one of those things of, I know sometimes people kind of poo-poo at like the nationals, oh, it's drawing attention. Well, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? And his work is both well done, he is pushing envelopes and he's drawing attention. And I think that's kind of, it's got the trifecta right there is it's good work. It is well done. And it is makes, uh, you know, draws both the modeler's eye and the general public's eye. That'd be, that was an awesome discussion. I'm glad uh, we got to talk about it. Uh, just, uh, I, I always enjoy peek inside the brains of my fellow modelers mm-hmm. and I cherish everything that you guys have to say. And I love, all, you know, love and respect mm-hmm. all of your all's work and of course your opinions. So, and then hearing you guys validate how I feel makes you feel good. So yeah, that was awesome. Gobbles. Their stuff sucks, dude. <laughs> Grant, I, I think what you meant to say was it's okay. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Since, you know. And, and you know what, uh, you know what, Scott, thank you. Thank you for saying that because I want everyone to know that it is okay to think that your work is okay. You don't have to think it's amazing. It's okay. If it's not, it, it really is. I'd say that all the time. Some of my work's pretty good. Some of it's okay. Some of it's not so good. None of my work's amazing. And you guys put up with me. So, you know, you just, <laughs> and, and I think, I think that's actually what, what I want to walk away from is my, my thing was that I want to be better. I just want to produce work. Like one of the things I was going to say during the conversation is these, these people who build one model at a time freak me out because some of the models I've learned the most from never got finished. And I think there's also, so an ability to do that of, of you can level up without finishing because you've learned something that you now can take forward in the future. You maybe didn't quite work on this one. So there's no wrong way to do it other than build one model at a time. That's that's. For sure. <laughs> and, and maybe another add on to this, too, is and it kind of goes back to TJ's comment, never fall in love with your work. And maybe something along those lines, too, is explore sharing your work, you know, give it to somebody, you know, if, you know, if they show interest towards it, if they love it, you know, one of the most liberating things is letting work go. And I know, you know, some people might not build a lot and they want to keep their work and that's totally fine. And sometimes it's just not for them. And I totally get it. Um, but, you know, we did it at Nats. I left a few with Ivan. I have his figure. I have Spud's Achilles to bring to Scott. And then I have Dan Brooker's Panther too. You know, we talk about skill gaps. There's no other bit. Be- there's no better way to learn than having the work literally in front of you. And Scott, I plan on having that at my desk and you have to pry it from my fingers when you come over in March, but it'll serve as a, you know, as a tutor, as a lesson, as an example of what 
can be done in scale. And it's almost like reverse engineering it to understand how to, how to level up in those cases. Yeah. My model case has work from almost all of you guys, Jim, those, those pieces are, are, are incredibly meaningful for me. And so um, listeners out there, um, like John said, uh, don't be afraid to share your work with your friends. I would much rather have the Skyhawk I have in my case from Ivan or the, you know, the slave one um, that TJ sent me. Um, I have more of his work, but that piece is special. You know, Grant gave me a bust of Thanos that, you know, is incredible. I have some of John's work. I mean, just these pieces have real meaning um, for me. So uh, that's a tradition I hope that we can spread around because I think it's really, really valuable. Like John said, let it go, give it to your friends and, and then maybe you know, if, if you see a piece of theirs that inspires you, maybe see if you, you know, you can take it. So anyway, I think, I think it's a great, great idea. I just have to point out to you, Scott, Christmas is coming. Keep an eye on your mailbox. (laughs) And maybe a way to wrap up this segment, you know, we'd love to hear from our listeners. What's the skill gap? What, uh, you know, what would you like to learn? And I think what we could find is making those connections where someone's like, ah, you know, I'm really struggling with mud. I'd love to level up here, close the gap here. And I, you know, I'm going to be a little bit forward looking, but I'm going to guess that some of our listeners are also good in those areas in which others are not. So I think it's an opportunity to help collaborate, help work together and help each other close those gaps. You know, so I I just encourage that too. So feel free to, uh, you know, feel free to post away. I want to welcome HobbySwap.com to the Plastic Posse. Has your stash become monstrous? Yes. Need cash for maybe just some extra space? Yes. Or maybe to grow your collection? Oh, yes. Try to find that special unique kit always. Well, whatever you need, check out HobbySwap.com. That's HobbySwap.com. Did I mention that the HobbySwap.com, you can list as many models as you want for free? Yes, I said free. That's right. Unlimited free listings. They also have lower listing fees than any other big named auction site. And it's easy to use. Posting a kit for sale takes literally less than 30 seconds. HobbySwap.com. Like going to a model shop every time you log in. Check out HobbySwap.com today at HobbySwap.com. All right. We're going to do a quick segment on social media shout outs. This is the point of the episode where we're going to highlight a few pieces of work that we saw online. I'm going to kick it off and then open up the floor to anyone else that has any highlights that they'd like to share. You know, for me, it really comes back to the group and some of the members of it. First off, I'd love to recognize Luftram 72s Yag Panther. He's doing a fantastic job on one of my favorite vehicles and really shows his breadth and depth of scale modeling skills from aircraft to sci-fi and now armor. His Yag Panther is a clear example of what you can do in Braille scale because in some pictures, it's confusing because it honestly represents something in 35th, I see. So great work, Chris. Keep it up. We cannot wait to see your next steps in weathering. Jesse Naughton stands out with his destroyed ISU 152. He's getting into the painting there and really starting to show some of the weather effects of a blown up vehicle. So rust, dust, you know, going into the chart effects, smoke and grime, all those really coming together. And I cannot wait to see the final scene. Scott Pasishnik's Ketten Krad and his two figures looks really nice. And then lastly, I'd love to highlight Luke's Night Titan. Ivan and I were very fortunate enough to see this over the weekend at Telford. I believe he took a gold there as well. Mm -hmm. So huge shout out to Luke. Your work is inspiring and please keep it up. Please keep sharing in the group and huge congrats, buddy. So, and we will hear from Luke again. He's going to be part of the Telford roundtable. So look forward to that listeners. So one of the ones I'd like to talk about just really quick is one of our buddies over at the Geeks. Don't know if you guys have seen Whitey's uh, T-34B. I'm pretty sure it's a 148 scale. And I think he gets bonus points because I think it's a Kitty Hawk kit. It's fantastic. He's got it painted up in a really bright yellow Navy paint scheme. And it's just, it's honestly, it's one of the, the nicest aircraft I've seen in a while. So Whitey, great job. It's actually worse. It's a mini craft kit. Oh. But uh, the one that jumped out to me was Steve Baker, and I am not going to say the name, but we'll let um, let Ivan do it. Daniel from AK posted a black Korean War Corsair, which I think was 48 scale, and it was awesome. Yes, uh, Daniel Zamabide is uh, an outstanding aircraft modeler. He's he's my favorite aircraft modeler. All right, that'll wrap it up for social media shoutouts. Over to Jimmy B. 
First, I just want to say that if you have time, check out the Plastic Posse page on Facebook. It's a community page where every member can share and discuss their projects. In the past two weeks, we have dozens, if not hundreds of posts of our uh, friends and our work. We work to keep it clean and fun for everyone and keep out those evil t-shirt salesmen. But uh, what I'm going to talk about is I've got three uh, listener mail here or feedback. The first one is Charles from South Carolina, and he says, Hey guys, I love the podcast. I've been binging currently on episode 18. I've built armor kits on and off for 20 years, but I only really got into it in the last two years. I love dioramas. I've learned a lot from you guys. You've also sent me down some dangerous rabbit holes, LOL. Keep up the good work. And then he included some pics of his builds. I have a feeling we may have another uh, Martin Drayton on our hands with that guy. This one is an interesting one. It says, ah, Brookman. I hope I got that right. Hey, guys, I just started building models because I found out, found my dad's old modeling stuff, and he taught me to model. I know I'm a little new to your podcast, and I just listened to episode six, where you talk about how to power an airbrush. My dad got me an old airbrush, Badger 350. It has a feature that gives it the ability to catch to a car tire. So I want to uh, say you could check uh, if your airbrush can do it, if you don't have a lot of money to spend on a compressor. And he says, thank you guys for the podcast. Keep up the good work. And he is from the Netherlands. And uh, I don't know, a compressor seems to take up a whole lot less space than a a, a car tire. But hey, then we've got Tyler Shepard. Hey, I just want to have a quick question about the Mac group build. In the rules, it says it needs to stick with the Mac aesthetic, and I just want to make sure my idea for my build will be within that. I'm wanting to incorporate a lot of elements from Fallout into my build, as Mac reminds me a lot of Fallout. Basically, I'm wanting to make it seem like my MK44s are mech suits in the Fallout universe. So they have a paint job that's from Fallout, weapons from Fallout, and just small details from Fallout. Does this still qualify? Was hoping to make this a surprise, as I know some of you guys are huge fans of Fallout, but I figure I'll still keep it as a surprise for everyone else in the group build. Sorry, Tyler, I guess I ruined your surprise, but over to TJ with the answer. Roll with it. Tyler, I guess that was a yes. And that is uh, all of the, uh, all of the uh, feedback for today. Uh, keep sending those in. Uh, they'll probably talk about the the email in a second, but plastic posse, po- plastic posse podcast at gmail.com and or message the podcast through the Facebook. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, TJ for uh, preparing a great episode, Ivan and John for some awesome feedback from Telford. We're going to hear more of that. So stay tuned on our social media pages for that. We want to thank Jim for joining us in the uh, Jim Bates seat and going above and beyond just being a guest and uh, really appreciate that. Appreciate all the feedback that you're sending us in. Uh, Let us know what you think of our episodes. We want to thank all of you for being the best listeners and supporters and just being a part of our great community. Join us if you can over the Thanksgiving weekend for our group build. And uh, if not, hopefully each of you will get to spend some time over the holiday at your bench doing the best hobby out there, uh, which of course is scale modeling. So there's only one thing left to say. I'm I'm no I'm no Doug. (laughs) You know, I finally figured out I'm the snakeless Doug. That's who I am today. TJ, how are you going to wrap this up? <laughs> That's awesome. I'm not. You're going to wrap it up. Okay. Oh. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought we were all friends here. Jeez. <laughs>
not my problem. You deal with it. <laughs> oh, stone cold, man. I got my beer and my chips. I'm good. I'm good. I'm not driving. Not my problem. <laughs> not my problem. Sounds like a you problem. I'm good. That's future TJ problem. <laughs> it's a present Scott problem. 